Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm super happy. Super happy that I was able to, to get this win. And I mean, she's an, an unbelievable player. She played really great tennis. And um, yeah, I'm just super happy right now. And guys. Alexander Stewart says that his latest song, Blame It On Me, is all about accountability in a breakup. A 23-year-old Canadian who's now based in L.A. started out as a YouTuber. His debut track, Backwards, garnered more than 23 million streams online. The new song, Blame It On Me, has now racked up millions of streams. Stewart says fans might relate to the song's sentiment. Gone and quits. You were giving me all that I could need. I was missing it. Now I'm all alone going through our old messages. Flames on me. Hey, this is such a cliche. Don't know what, what you have till it's gone away. But that don't take, take away any pain. I'm still here sleeping in the bed of me. It was crazy because it's the first song where I ever really, I flipped the narrative onto myself essentially and took responsibility. Um, and it's been really, really crazy to me to see the reaction to it because I guess there's other people that feel this way. Um, I mean, it's kind of mind blowing to me. I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, it's, it's funny cause it's the most like, you know, personal, um, personal song I've ever written. That's for sure. And it's also a song where I take accountability, essentially. Well, that's it for today. Up next in the morning show, it's a full day ahead. And every moment, indeed, those matter. I am D. Amund. Thank you for watching. I am Ken Thormack. Good morning. Yesterday I got a call from Blue. I won the three bedroom Pongalu. Yes, guys! Guess what? I won a car. I won a generator by participating in the festival of Joy Promo by Glow. Hey, Glow don't do this one for me. Glow is making sense to me with sewing machine. I won generator last year. This year I won for art. It's a celebration like no other, with prizes like no other. 20 new houses to be won, 24 brand new cars, 200 sewing machines, 100 generators, 1,000 rechargeable fans. Glow Festival of Joy promo. Dial star 611 hash now. At last, the elections are here. Let's turn out en masse on election day and vote Ashiwa Yubola Tinubu as president of Nigeria for a renewed hope and a better Nigeria. Vote APC, the party that shows a broom. One planet, our world. 200 countries, 500 cities of over a million. 8 billion people with your own story every day, every news day. We make sense of all the noise because you need to know what's important for you, your family, your business, and how it affects your story. Breaking news, the top stories. All the sports updates as they come in. And the very latest entertainment news from Nigeria and the world. Our stories are your stories. From our headquarters in Lagos, our rise news day for three hours every day. Make every day a news day.
Knowledge is power. Information is currency. Trust us to tell you what you need to hear. Welcome to the program. You're with Arise News in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Breaking news, exclusive interviews, unrivaled analysis. It's you, the audience, who drives our agenda. We tell the stories that inform you, the stories that are important to you, and the stories that are about you. We are not every news channel. We are Arise News. It all starts with a bell. And that bell means it's business time. The bell rings in London, Lagos, Cairo, and Joburg, kicking off a new day of opportunities. New idea been born and bought, deals been done, big global players winning big or losing it all. IPOs, mergers, takeovers, stocks, bonds, and commodities. In the business world, the winner takes the spoils. In the business day, every moment matters. Trust us to be your guide to the highs and lows of the global marketplace. We will round up the business day was up, was down, the beers and the bulls, and what to watch out for. This is a rise exchange. Showbiz. If it's happening in the world of entertainment, you'll be hearing about it here. From what's trending on the socials, to music and movies, and all the latest showbiz gossip from around the world. Join us for a front row seat at the Oscars in Los Angeles, or the biggest moments from Fashion Week. It's fun, it's fresh, and it's packed full of all the entertainment news you need to know. You heard it here first. I'm Kachi Ofia, and this is Arise 360, where every culture matters. heart of the business world in Lagos, the commercial capital of Africa's largest economy. These aren't just numbers. They represent our nation's sharpest minds, our most successful investors, our most inspiring bosses. In Nigeria, business is in our DNA. From micro-business to startups to world-conquering brands, every success story has something in common. They all started somewhere. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Global Business Report gets to the heart of business. We bring you the stories making headlines across the globe with in-depth analysis from experts and executives. This is not business as usual. This is the Global Business Report.
Good morning. You are watching The Morning Show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. I'm Ayo Mayo Essay. And I'm Rafael Senior. I've got a great show lined up for you over the next three hours. So sit back, relax, and let's kick start your day because The Morning Show begins right now. As preparation for the 2023 general election reaches advanced stages, attempts to distort election outcomes using manipulation strategies are on the rise. Key actors are devising strategies to punctuate electoral preparations and neutralize the impact of laudable reforms aimed at enhancing the integrity of the electoral process. Recently, the presidential candidate of the ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, Bola Tinubu on Wednesday alleged that a plot is being made to scuttle the general elections scheduled to hold next month. However, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and the Nigerian civil society groups are not leaving any stone unturned in their quest to ensure that a free, fair, and credibly, credible election holds in Nigeria. Thus, the CSOs have embarked on the presentation of the first iteration report of the Election Manipulation Risk Index, EMRI, which hosts today at the Transcopy Hotel in Abuja. The Election Manipulation Risk Index is a data-driven and evidence-based tool designed by a group of civil society organizations to curb election manipulation, facilitate strategic election planning, and promote citizens' oversight of the electoral process. The EMRI monitors strategies and tools employed by election stakeholders to manipulate the electoral process. In addition, the EMRI outlines mitigation measures to avert the risks posed by these actors. Joining us later on this show from our Abuja studio as we discuss the alleged plot to scuttle the 2023 polls, if any, and the Election Manipulation Risk Index first iteration report are SN1 Wagu Chairman, Partners for Electoral Reform, and Lebari Undo, Director of Security, Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. Moving things along, we shall be engaging Hajia Maria Ibrahim Baba, a member of the Public Affairs Directorate of the Ruling All Progressives Congress, to discuss the campaign activities of the APC and, in addition, comment and clarify some of the allegations stated yesterday by Hajia Najatu Mohammed. Let's catch up on news making headlines across the globe. Michael Wilson gives us an update on global business outlook. While Road Sudiri will update us on Africa business activities across the continent, Aaron Akerajala will be taking us through spotting activities across the globe. We'll also review today's newspaper with Arise News Analyst Amalu Laferi, while Audrey Ogbe will fill us in on what's trending around the world. It's going to be all that and a whole lot more today on The Morning Show. Welcome back to the Morning Show, right here on the Rise News Channel. It's now time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. The House of Representatives has threatened to issue an arrest warrant on the Governor of Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Amir for the directors of the Apex Bank and chief executives of bank that refused to honor the invitation of the House. Otunji uh, Alani Pekmo brings us the report. To the expiration of the deadline given by the Central Bank of Nigeria to phase out the old 1,000 Naira. 500 Naira and 200 Naira denomination. But with complaints of scarcity of the new Naira notes by Nigerians, which has become a major issue in the last few weeks, affecting business transactions and hampering economic activities, the House of Representatives invited the CBN and bank chiefs to clarify the complaints. The CBN and the bank CEOs were initially scheduled to appear on Wednesday, but could not appear because of the late correspondence to them and the meeting was rescheduled for Thursday. While the House at her committee on the issue was waiting for the CBN governor on Thursday, Speaker, House of Representatives, announced to his colleagues on the floor that he just received a letter from the CBN that the governor would not be available because he's on a trip with the president to Senegal. 
Bajabia Miller expressed displeasure with the development, which he said is insensitive of the regulators to the plight of Nigerians. The Central Bank Act under Section 20 allows the Central Bank to change the legal tender. But it also says that even five months after, three months after, two months after, even in June, any old note presented to the bank shall be redeemed by the bank. That point needs to be made to the central bank and to the public. The House of Representatives is expected to go on recess this week, but the visibly angry Bajabia Miller said the House will not go on recess until the central bank governor and the bank chiefs appear before it. Bajabia Miller says if MFLA and bank CEOs refuse to appear, the House will have no other choice than to invoke Section 89D of the Constitution and Order 19 of the Standing Order of the House of Representatives. The refusal by the CBN or managing directors to heed the invitation by the House of Representatives is evidence of a blatant, blatant disregard for the well-being of the Nigerian people who are their customers. It is also an insult to the authority and prerogatives of the People's Parliament. Therefore, if by the end of today, there is further disregard to the summons of this house, I will, without hesitation, issue a warrant to the Inspector General of the Nigerian Police to compel the attendance of the CBN and or managing directors who fail, refuse, or neglect to respond to the summons by the House of Representatives. The House insists its intervention is in the interest of the people as representatives of Nigerians who have heard the complaints of the people on the new currency scarcity and its imminent effect on the livelihood of the masses. All right, a lot to talk about, Aria, this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. And morning, um, yeah. still on this, this is an update mm. on the Naird redesign, and now the CBN governor has been summoned. By, was summoned by the National Assembly to come before it following the institution of an ad hoc committee headed by Honorable Dogoa Al Hassan, a majority leader, to intervene, to interface between the CBN and bank CEOs, you know, um, deposit money bank CEOs and, um, you know, senior officials. What we see there is that it's, uh, it's a follow up of claims by banks that they haven't received the new Naira notes, hence their inability to dispense to their customers. In the, past, in, the, in the past few weeks, we have talked about the fact that people say that when they go to the, their ATMs or automated teller machines or to the banks, they are unable to access new notes. So what we've had is people are going to deposit old notes and getting back the old notes when they, uh, when they try to get money out of the ATMs. And in investigating this, whilst the CBN on one hand is saying we have dispersed, we, we, the money is available, some banks are refusing to come and collect. In fact, to this effect, the CBN had put a penalty that for every, every day a bank does not come in to uh, take uh, the, 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 the notes allocated to them, they'd be fined by one million naira. And uh, the banks, on the other hand, are saying that, well, the CBN is not giving us what we need. They're giving us a bid but it's not enough to cater to our customers. In fact, the CEO, the bank representatives who were present uh, before the uh, committee had said that they were receiving 60%, 70%, 80% of the old notes that they had deposited as new notes from the Central Bank of Nigeria. So the uh, National Assembly, in investigating this, thought it was important to then bring both sides of the party to, a, you know, to, to appear before them to defend themselves as to who is really telling the truth. Is it the CBN who is saying that we have given enough money, or the banks who are saying we haven't received enough money? Who is jeopardizing this new Naira, um, the Naira redesign uh, from being implemented come the 1st of February? Because by the 31st of January, I think we should even still stop saying it by date. By Tuesday of next week, the 1st of January, 
it's going to cease to be legal tender. Now, this is not the first time the National Assembly has invited the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Governor uh, Gordon Emefiele, to appear before it to explain or, you know, to speak to the House as to, number one, the, uh, the, the issues around the fact that people were not having access to these new notes, why the distribution wasn't spread across, and also to present the case that people who lived in the hinterland or in, in rural areas in particular were largely affected by this because they didn't have access to the cash, um, access to the new notes. In December of 2022, the deputy governor of the CBN represented Mrs. Aisha Ahmed, represented the CBN governor because the CBN governor was said to be out of the country. A few, on Thursday, the CBN governor did not appear before the House because he was also said to be out of the country on, official, um, on an official assignment to the president. Mr. Femi Adeshino had released a statement on Tuesday, or earlier this week, to say that the president was going to be traveling to Senegal for an agriculture, you know, a, a summit on agriculture hosted by the president of Senegal. However, he did mention that the president would be returning on Wednesday, which the um, Speaker of the House had alluded, alluded to that the President was back, so why was the CBN governor not back? Um, we have, there's no statement yet, yet released by the CBN, aside the letter which um, the Speaker of the House had mentioned was sent to them that he wasn't available to appear before them. Then leading to the topic of conversation today, which is the fact that the House of Reps um, Speaker has now said that they are going to is issue a warrant of arrest to the CBN governor. I'll just say one thing on this issue and then pass on to Doctor. I will defer to him uh, in terms of the interpretation of the seg uh, segments of the law that both, you know, the uh, House Speaker quoted in terms of his right. Yes acknowledging that the CBN is the CBN governor is has independence in the adjudication of his duties but that they also have a right to ask that he comes before the house and he can issue an you know warrant to a citizen of the nation including the CBN governor you know in line with all the things that have been happening recently it's difficult to not ask the question why the house of assembly particularly some members of the house not the entire house are against this 31st of January deadline. Why is it so important for them to see it extended? Even asking that, okay, you can stop it as being legal tender, but you can allow months afterwards to still accept the exchange of old notes, you know, as you know, in terms and new notes. The drama is still unfolding. It would be great to hear what the CBN governor would say in terms of his um, um, unwillingness or perhaps failure to appear before the house in the next few hours or days. But by Tuesday. Um, the Speaker of the House, Honorable Bajabi Amelia, has said he's going to institute the issue of warrant of arrest against the CBN governor. Dr. Bajabi. Okay, on Tuesday this week, well, the uh, Senate and the uh, House of Representatives passed the resolution, more or less, asking the Central Bank of Nigeria to extend the de January 31st deadline to July. This was the second time that both houses of the National Assembly will be making that request. Before now, the Senate had summoned the CBN governor and he appeared before that uh, Senate uh, to explain uh, the Naira redesign policy and steps, measures that had been taken. The House of Reps also summoned the CBN governor before now. He sent a deputy governor uh, to represent him because this was at the time uh, he was in the United States uh, uh, as part of the delegation of the president to attend the U.S.-Africa Leaders uh, Summit. And the explanations uh, given by that deputy governor were basically the positions, you know, an articulation of the position of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Now, since then, what has been observed is that the measures that the CBN governor talks about, those measures, there have been criticisms about those measures. The, the banks not making the new notes available, either across the counter or through the ATM uh, machines, as the uh, CBN directed. The banks not working on Saturdays. The cash swap program that was introduced to address the concerns of uh, persons in rural areas uh, is going to also time out by uh, January 31. Many people are not uh, you know, uh, getting the benefit of that initiative such that, in fact, some supermarkets ahead of the deadline have stopped uh, collecting the old new notes. Such that, in fact, in one wedding in Bakuloku government area in Niger State, 
uh, in-laws rejected the money that was brought to, uh, as bride price by, uh, by a suitor. They returned the money. They said, you cannot come and take our brand new daughter with uh, old notes. If you want a new thing, you come with new things. OK, that's how you know, uh, serious the situation is. And it's all of this that I think the uh, House of Reps, the National Assembly, is inquiring into. Do they have the powers to do so? Well, as representatives of the people, I think they have the power to invite anybody to inquire into anything in the interests of the people of Nigeria. Do they have the powers to set up an ad hoc committee as uh, the House of Representatives uh, chose to do, making the majority leader, Al Hassan Dugara, the chairman of that ad hoc committee? Yes, they have such powers under Section 62 of the 1999 Constitution. Now, the uh, House of Reps, not seeing the, chief, uh, the CBN governor, with the excuse that first, the invitation came late. Second, it was away in Senegal with the president. I think they are back now. The president was in uh, Casina yesterday. So the House of Representatives now says they will invoke their powers under Section 89 of the uh, Constitution, which gives the House the power to issue a warrant of arrest. And as the Inspector General of Police, or as the section says, any policeman to arrest anybody against whom such a warrant is issued. And this is also in line with order 19, subsection 1 of the uh, rules of, uh, of the uh, House of Representatives. So, uh, Honorable Gwajabi Amila, the speaker, is threatening that this will happen. But if you look at the section 20, subsection 3 of the CBN Act that he is quoting, uh, we talks about, oh, you know, upon demand, you must uh, still uh, honor you know, a particular currency. Well, as a lawyer, you ought to know that what you do is a community reading. You can't just pick one section of the, uh, of the CBN Act and read it in isolation. Because if you look at that same CBN Act, you read it all the way down to section 24. It talks about the powers of the CBN to redesign notes, to issue new notes. The only person who has authority in that regard is the uh, president of Nigeria. But the same CBN Act asserts the independence of the, uh, of the uh, CBN. The second point it, with regard to beyond community reading is the fact that the House of uh, Representative Speaker, how does he intend to execute that warrant of arrest? Will the uh, Inspector General of Police go and arrest the CBN governor? What are the implications for financial stability. We will just find ourselves in another ridiculous situation whereby we will be arresting our CBN governor. What signal would that send to the international community and also to investors? And in any case, even the uh, House of Representatives will need to carry the president along. So how do they hope to navigate all of that? But as people expressing, lawmakers expressing concern on behalf of the Nigerian people, well, you cannot blame them. They can do that. The only power that they have in this regard, however, long term, is to change the law. So I've, we've seen it before, I think with the NDDC Act, mm. they could change the law within three or four days. Mm. But would they get the concurrence of the uh, Senate? Would the Senate go with the House of Reps? So it's a very difficult, you know, tricky uh, situation. And the advice would just be that nobody, be they lawmakers, or you know, state officials should not do anything that will further heat up the system, further make the financial situation, the fiscal space, you know, uh, more more unstable, you know, uh, for Nigerians and for investors. So I, I saw the uh, uh, speaker of the house, you know, issuing threats and sounding like uh, the policeman of the CBN. Well, <laughs> you know, he should look at it in a more in a more you know sober, more comprehensive. Uh, uh, manner. And I believe that, you know, whatever it is, uh, good reason will prevail at the end of the day. I always hate to say I told you so, but if you play my tape yesterday, what did I say? I say more threats will come in the coming days. There will be more attacks to this policy. Less than 24 hours after I said that, you can hear one of the most brazen attacks on this policy. I analyze politically and I analyze making very logical arguments. What are the politicians afraid of about this policy? No money to buy votes, probably, because I don't see the reason for all of it. 
It's a policy that has a lot of problems, and please don't get me wrong. And everybody must come to the table. The banks must come to the table. Everybody must come to the table. The CBN2 must admit that they, they can ramp up logistics and do a whole lot more. The banks too must admit that they should fix their own problems. And we don't want to hear the case of banks selling the money to some people to favor some other people. Because in all of this, why is it so difficult for us to get in the ATMs and places where they change money in parties have this money, the new notes? So there's a lot of undercutting and dealings going on. But the political angle to it is what shocks me. Why the threats? To summon the CBN governor to speak about a policy that a lot of clarifications were made at the MPC meeting? Why the threats? I ask, why? I wish the House of Reps speaker could be that vigorous in summoning service chiefs when they don't come and issue arrest warrant on them, I'll be very happy. Secondly, let us not interfere with the independence of the CBN. The CBN is independent. Or, at least, let us say, on the beats, the things it ought to do. Because if you check the core mandate of the CBN, how about currency regulation, monetary policy, and the likes? So why try to interfere by even going ahead to having a conclave to say that they should extend it till July? No, the, the National Assembly should not overreach itself. The CBI gave a deadline of the 31st. Let us stick to that. Why the push for the July after the elections? What is going on here? And in the middle of all of this, just two days ago, we heard a dog whistle. So are we putting off all of this together? Are we reading the tea leaves here? The CBN governor has not broken any part of the CBN Act. And I'm happy you pointed out the CBN Act, Dr. Abati. Let's read it in, in its entirety. It's got community written. Yes. And there's a level of independence in the CBN. It's its remit. The timeline it is supposed to use for the change of currency is written in the Act. And it has fulfilled that timeline. It's a three-month window. Let us leave Mr. Mefele out of this politics we are playing. If the policy has teaching problems, as the problems come up, we'll start to fix them. But 31st of July, let's stick to that. And let's maintain the independence of the CBN, whether it suits us or not. We'll take a short break now. I mean, 31st of uh, Janu uh, January, I should say, not July. We'll, we'll take, when we, we'll take, okay, Doctor, I uh, hear you, you have to read this. Okay, we'll take a short break now, and when we return, we'll be talking to SN1 Wago, Chairman, Partners for Electoral Reform, and Lebari Undu, Director of Security, Independent National Electoral Commission. Stay with us. We'll be right back. SMEs and corporate customers. Download Vault by Polaris Bank from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store to get started today. Yesterday I got a call from Glove. I want a three bedroom bungalow. Yes, guys! Guess what I want? 
a car. I won a generator by participating in the festival of Joy Promo by Glow. Hey, Glow don't do this one for me. Glow is making sense to me with sewing machine. I won generator last year. This year I won for her. It's a celebration like no other with prizes like no other. 20 new houses to be won. 24 brand new cars. 200 sewing machines. 100 generators, 1,000 rechargeable fans. Glow Festival of Joy promo. Dial star 611 hash now. Nigeria has a problem. A really big problem. The problem has made our country sick and we cannot remain sick for four more years. Nigeria is sick with insecurity, poverty, rising cost of living, and an escalating Japa crisis. The good thing is, Nigeria has a pathway to recovery. And when we recover, our country will be safe. When we recover, our economy will grow. When we recover, our nation will be stronger. We have to recover from this sickness. So we can recover from lost ground. Recover our time, recover our future, and our dignity on the African continent. In 2023, it is Nigeria time to recover. And together, we can get it done. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. As preparation for the 2023 general election reaches advanced stages, attempts to distort election outcomes using manipulation strategies are on the rise. Key actors are devising strategies to punctuate electoral preparations and neutralize the impact of laudable reforms aimed at enhancing the integrity of the electoral process. Recently, the presidential candidate of the ruling All Progressives Congress, APC, Bola Tinumbu, on Wednesday alleged that a plot is being made to scuttle the general elections scheduled to hold next month. However, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and the Nigerian civil society groups are not leaving any stone unturned in their quest to ensure that a free, fair, and credible election holds in Nigeria. Thus, the CSOs have embarked on the presentation of the first iteration report of the Election Manipulation Risk Index, EMRI, which hosts today at the Transcomputing in Abuja. The EMRI monitors strategies and tools employed by election stakeholders to manipulate the electoral process. In addition, EMRI outlines mitigation measures to avoid the risks posed by these actors. Joining us now on the show from Abuja studio, as we discuss the alleged plot to scuttle the 2023 polls, if any, and the Election Manipulation Risk Index EMR first iteration report, are Ezen Wanwago, Chairman, Partners for Electoral Reform, and Lebari Undu, Director of Security, Independent National Electoral uh, Commission, INEC. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on the morning show. Well, let me start with you uh, first. Uh, is in one wago to take us through this uh, EMRI that I referred to. I've seen some slides, about ten of them, and basically uh, the report is talking about high risk states, medium risk states, low risk states. And what I see in the summary is that it's only in three states that the risk of manipulation is low. Twenty-four states are high risk states. So if you could just take us through you know, that report that will be presented today. And then uh, Mr. Lebari Undu uh, can speak to how prepared INEC is. We've been hearing INEC is prepared. INEC is ready, but how prepared is INEC? Please go ahead, Mr. Mwago. Show this morning. Um, the 
EMRI is, is simply a rapid uh, citizen tool that uh, tool that citizens can use to scan the electoral environment and then um, through that uh, method uh, see the, pos the 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 potentials if you like the not just the potentials and in some cases possibilities of uh, the 2023 election uh, being manipulated and uh, the EMR uh, the index had identified broadly six um, six uh, you know areas that uh, we think uh, constitute uh, real threat and like you said uh, 22 states um, are in red meaning that they are high and uh, what this means is that where we find three of these uh, six that I'm going to be talking about then those states are actually high and then the medium and then the the low risk and the low risk just three of them FCT Gombe and them um, and one other state are the states that are low risk states the other 22 uh, are indeed and those will be first and foremost we'll be talking about INEC, uh, INEC capture uh, INEC capture in this sense we are talking about the processes of uh, appointment of resident electoral commissioners which you know we are where we raised very red, red flags for some states where we felt that some of those people who were appointed as resident electoral commissioners did not meet uh, the integrity threshold that the constitution has set up. And so it's important that citizens who live in those particular states where those resident electoral commissioners that we pointed out are on the guard to ensure that uh, they, they, they do not constitute any real um, threat to the, to the process. And then we, we are talking about uh, the manipulation of the voter register. And uh, in this circumstance, we're talking about situations where uh, fictitious names, um, underage voters, and indeed people, um, people who have no business being in the register, being, being put in the register. And we're, we're also bothered, if you like, about uh, the issue of voter suppression. And uh, in this, we are talking about what you are seeing in, in the collection of the PVC, the way citizens are raising very strong hue uh, and, and cry around, around those, those issues about the, the bottlenecks that are placed on their way to, to collecting the PVC. Those indeed for us uh, constitute real, uh, real, real risk. And then there is the resistance to uh, resistance to election technology, uh, the, the, the IREV, the BIVAS particularly, uh, and uh, it's not news that uh, there are concerns in some quarters about uh, the introduction of uh, technology, and that for us uh, will also, also be part of the challenge that we're going to see. And there are states that have history of, um, <clears throat> history of election manipulation. Uh, those, uh, if you triangulate it in the way it impacts electoral integrity, you would, you would then find out that those can be challenged. And then there are issues of frivolous um, litigations, um, frivolous litigations uh, across the states. We did, we were told recently by the INEC chairman that about 600 post-election um, litigations are you know, out there about, about, about that. 600 election litigations are out there, many of them uh, not, not, not very important. So the, the EMRI is important for us in the sense that we had drawn this from, you know, expert interviews. It is indeed a qualitative to draw from expert interviews, um, observations, uh, critical observations and um, content analysis, you know. So we're, we're hoping that um, with this uh, tool uh, in the hand of citizens, they are able then to scan the environment and uh, put in uh, mitigating factors that can help to ensure that uh, the 2023 elections are not uh, manipulated. And I did tell you that 22 states are in the high risk area, um, <clears throat> 12 are in medium, and um, just three of those states are in. Uh, uh, low risk. That that is the summary of what the uh, the election manipulation risk index is about.
Well, uh, Mr. Undu, Mr. Lebari Undu, you just listened to uh, uh, Mr. Wagu, and you are head of security of INEC. These risks that he has identified, what are those measures to address those risks? Is INEC aware also of those risks? Yeah, I think uh, INEC has also done its own uh, risk analysis by the Electoral Institute. And our results are not far from what he has said. But the, que the question is, are Nigerian citizens ready to protect and defend the democracy they have? Because it's not enough to find out this risk and prefer solutions or mitigations to it. If the people who own it refuse to own it, then there's a problem. Like I said, Nigerians must own the process. Nigerians must take the process, take control of the process. What INEC is doing and has been doing the past four years is to ensure that they prepare a transparent process, taking all stakeholders along at every stage of the process, at every stage of the preparation. Stakeholders are called upon, given what INEC has done, and inputs and suggestions from them are taken very seriously by the Commission, especially the civil society organizations, the security organizations, the political class, and the press. No segment of the society is left behind in the inclusiveness of the preparation of INEC. And so INEC is always two, three steps ahead of what the planners of doom will want to do. Like Mr. Eisenhower said, it is true that there are high risk states, but the question is, what are the citizens of those states doing? They must get up and own the process. If you don't own the process, my people say elders cannot be at home and they allow a he goat deliver in tetas. So the people should come up, own the process, collaborate with INEC and the civil society, synergize with the security agencies, because the planners of all these things we are talking about, they are not from Cameroon. They are in Nigeria. They are our neighbors, they are our brothers. They are our relations. We know them. So all of us must put us on deck to ensure that the process that INEC has started is concluded in a very thorough, transparent, clear, and inclusive manner. Um, Undu, when you say that all hands should be on deck, but the, the parameters or the variables that were used by in this research are one, INEC capture, that's in your hands in terms of the um, registra uh, voter registra register, uh, people who are on there. And, and we have had issues around that where we've seen underage voters, uh, multiple names on the voter register. We have manipulation of the voters register as second, voter suppression as another, resistance to BVAS and IREV, history of election manipulation and election litigation. A number of these responsibilities largely rest with how INEC has conducts itself and the elections. Case in point for voter suppression, many Nigerians have complained. Now, we've seen videos. Uh, we have had personal experiences as well, and it cuts across different, you know, different parts of the country where electorates or people who register to vote are unable to access their PVCs. An example was in the Tiosa local government area yesterday. From 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., only about three PVCs were released by your staff members. You know, some people said they were overwhelmed. So what is INEC doing? Because, yes, you can talk about people's responsibility, but we want to hear what INEC is doing to mitigate election manipulations in a few weeks. And then for uh, Mr. Nwagu, I, I see on, in one of your um, slides, I just want to talk about the low election manipula manipulation risks area. And there are only three areas identified in your report, Gombe, FCT, Undo. 
I'd like to, from your findings, what is the reason for this and what lessons can we learn, if any, from these states so that we can have low risks in other states that you've identified as high and medium? I'll come to Mr. Undu first in terms of INEX response. Yeah, I think uh, INEC has done its best and will continue to do its best. The truth of the matter is, in Nigeria, give us six months to do a thing. We will not come out to do it until it is three days, four days to the end. And then we'll begin to climb up, please extend it, extend it, extend it. This uh, collection of PVCs has been on. INEC even moved it from the local government level to the ROA level, that's the world level. And people were asked to go and collect their PVCs. It's nothing like suppression. And I, 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 will, I, will, I will stand to be corrected. The suppression you hear is people going there to try to collect cars that do not belong to them. And the INEC officials are under strict instruction. Don't give out cars that do not belong to individuals. You go there, that's why it is not distribution, it is collection. You go there and collect it. You don't send somebody to collect for you. And so that's one of the problems. We will not collect it on time, and when it is the rush hour, like we say, everybody will want there to go there and collect, and then at the end of the day, ANEC will be blamed. They are not doing this, they are not doing this. They are human beings like you. And I know that there are volunteers who have joined INEC to ease this collection of PVCs. The truth of the matter is, for the two weeks, these things were at the world level. People didn't go to collect it. It is now that it has moved to the local government area that people will say, oh, we are disenfranchised. We cannot go there because of this problem, because of that problem. Yes, we agree. There are teething problems, but they have been solved a great deal by the support the civil society has given to INEC. They gave us volunteers, paid by them, not by INEC, coppers, to ensure that the distribution points were many. How many people went there the first five days of collection? They didn't go because they, they know it's a Nigerian thing. We don't do it when we are supposed to do it. When the time is over, that's when everybody will rush, just like we are talking of currency. It's the same thing. Everything Nigerian is doing, you call them on time to do it, we'll wait until the last minute and we'll become to rush. And then that's a problem we have. But I think INEC has done well. If you talk of voter suppression, like I said, there's nothing like voter suppression. Let the people, if I have a card and I go there, I'll collect it. INEC has arranged it in such a way that these cars are kept in watch, in units. You cannot go there without a sleep. And then you will say it's voter suppression. INEC gave you a temporary sleep, with which when you come and show, they look at the sleep, they look at the unit, the pulling unit, they look at the ward, and it's easier for them to go there to pick. But when you come there, you say, oh, I registered here, I registered here. There are other activities the people are carrying on at the same time, multitask. So it will be difficult for them to solve that singular problem. It is true that the fewer, the fewer minority have their say because they have access to the media. But the greater majority that are collecting these things do not have a say. They just go there, search, give them the sleep, collect their cars and go. But I think that INEC will up his game. They are upping it to ensure that every card, every PVC, that has been printed is given out to the owner. It is not going to be given out by proxy. INEC will not, and I repeat, will not give out PVCs by proxy. All right, thank you for your statement. For Mr. Wango, just in terms of the lessons then from Gombe, FCT, and Ondo, which were identified as low risk in terms of election manipulation. Well, I, I just want to just uh, uh, just make a comment or two on, on what uh, the director of security has said. I, I think that um, it's important that 
even if there is that low, uh, that minority that, that is complaining, we need to take those complaints serious because um, one uh, black attack uh, can, can spread around the, the, the whole work that INEC is doing. So it's important that those that have been identified, there are unscrupulous INEC officials who are bringing to disrepute the work that, and some of them are always being shown on television. I've watched somebody in Otako here saying he paid some money on live television to say that he paid money uh, to INEC officials to be able to collect. My expectation was that there is going to be sanction and consequence. To, yeah. to explain it away uh, does not give confidence to the Nigerian voter that, you know, that INEC indeed is ready to punish officials who uh, the relict on their duty. I think it's important to just uh, make that comment. Then secondly, uh, the mitigation issues that needs to happen um, as we approach the 2023 election, we need to know those who are going to be working in this election. There is nothing wrong in INEC publishing the names of the ad hoc staff who will be involved in this electoral process so that we can know uh, they, they, we can run them through competency. I next should be able to run them through competency tests and, and the rest of them to ensure that some of these issues that have been raised uh, are not. Uh, what I find in Nigeria is when when an, uh, this kind of report is brought out, uh, we we get into the defense mode rather than uh, working very hard to ensure that those things, uh, civil society and the media are not in an adversarial relationship with with um, INEC or the stakeholders. So it's just important to say that. The lessons that can be learned from uh, Ondo, um, FCT, and Gombe is that, like I said, if three of the six um, issues that we have raised appear in any of the states, those states become um, high risk. So we are the do not occur in those states. So all that needs to happen is that where we've talked about voter suppression, INEC officials must ensure that the PVC collection is seamless and is rid of corrupt corruption that, that uh, people are complaining about. And it doesn't matter even if it is, is, is one person. We need to strengthen the idea of judicial officials uh, restraining themselves in giving this kind of frivolous injunctions that we are seeing and, and all of those kind of things. It has capacity to scuttle the electoral process if the judiciary goes into free reign. And our history is not, um, is not, is not devoid of uh, those kind of situations in which we have seen the judiciary ingloriously intervening uh, in the electoral process. So the learning curve for everyone is that civil society has put this out, and, and Arise has helped to amplify it to the world that there are potentials, there are tendencies for the manipulation of the 2023 election. And the Election Manipulation Risk Index is that citizen's tool that you can begin to use to scan the environment. And when you see these threats manifesting in any way, uh, is your responsibility. And I, I think also that election, like we keep saying, is a law-determined process. There okay. is the Electoral Act. There is the, 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 the INEC guidelines for the conduct of the elections. Okay. The security agents need to understand that if election fails, is a failure of law and order. Okay. And the role that they play in ensuring that the EMR, EMRI is not a prophecy foretold that will come to pass is also very critical and important. Okay. Okay. Real quick, Mr. No, hang on a minute. I, before, before I call. Uh, hang on a minute. I, I've got a question for you, sir. I, 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 I want, want to, to make, make a, a, you I want to make an allusion to what my brother is the one I've said. Okay, make it as regards the punishment of uh, uh, airing officials. Let me make it very clear that INEC does not condone its officials that violate the rules of the game. Most of the people who claim to be INEC officials are scammers. They come out and tell you, I work with this, I work with this, if you give me this, if you give me this. And if you ask the people who say they pay money to them, show me the INEC official that you pay the money to, you won't see them. This is practical experience 
that I have also seen. I've been called more than three, four, five times in the last two weeks okay. to come and see where we paid money to people. And you will get there and you will ask, who did you give the money to? You will see ANEC officials walking. They will not tell you it is this person that they okay. gave the money. Okay. And so it is what all of us should work okay. towards very eliminating. Very, very well and INEC is also doing it in a very transparent manner, particularly the recruitment of its ad hoc personnel. Okay. Nobody is employed manually. Okay. Everybody applied online. Okay. They have been scrutinized and they will be trained in the okay. public space, okay. not hiding, okay. where everybody who wants to see what has been done can go there and check. They okay. will be properly trained because okay. this is an election based, this is an election that is based on technology and INEC will not put a step wrong. Okay. And also, uh, I'd like to ask you two questions. It's a good you made clarification. Like uh, I, I think Mr. Eisen was said, uh, will the names of the ad hoc staff be published electronically? And I'd also like to ask you, as the chief of security in INEC, what's your security background check mechanism for this ad hoc staff? Are you putting any of such methods in place of a security background check for them and who they are? And thirdly, I'm, I'm sad to disappoint you, but people are not getting their PVCs. I, I don't think if you've gone through places like Lagos, where there was a protest yesterday, it's very difficult to get PVCs. Even there's also allegation of the fact that people are now being screened based on tribe and all of that. So it's not that easy. And I think I actually look into it. It's a feedback that cuts across all. 29th already we disenfranchised millions of people as we speak today. That's the reality on ground. And I think I next should double up. And uh, that's just a feedback for you, sir. And uh, you can also take that question. But for Mr. Ezenwa, my question for you would be, I'd like you to talk me through your methodology for your report. Let's, let's know what's, you know, the back end, the tilt. Let us see what happened. I know it's like, it's like a perception index. Let us see the rigor that went behind all of this in the first place. I'll come to you, sir. Then afterwards, uh, I'll talk to Mr. Ezenwa. All right. Uh, the commission is doing a thorough screening of all officials that applied online. All their background check, security background check, have been put into place. And you cannot claim who you are not. And that's the essence of the screening. We are screening them to ensure that what information they have given to us can be proved right. And if it is not proved right, those ones will not be taken because we know that they can come in with wrong information, with wrong purpose, and with wrong intention. And so the commission has put in a thorough plan to ensure that only those who meet the criteria are taken. The error of people submitting names here and there is no longer there. And that's why this portal was opened from September 14 to December 14. It was open for everybody to apply for all positions and for where you want to work. And it is open for people to check and see that there is nobody that is, will be on the list whose name was not properly screened. INEC is putting everything they know how to do in place to ensure that only those who are thoroughly screened and thoroughly trained. The training is not going to be like one or two, three days. It's going to take one, two weeks so that people will be conversant with the technology we are using. Right. And as for the other reports that uh, people are giving this, I will uh, get in touch with the resident electoral commissioner whose jurisdiction this thing are. Fortunately, he's already in Abuja for a meeting with the commission. And I'm sure the commission is also aware of this thing and will interrogate him, interrogate the message and the process, and then the, 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 the results will be made known to the public by the commission. Because the commission doesn't want anybody to be disenfranchised. 
Okay. Uh, so, so uh, the, okay, so the the uh, back end. Yeah. That the Thank methodology. You. The director. Um, the, the yes, I understand. Uh, I'll come to that. The the INEC officials we talk about the appoint agents. It is their agents because the 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 how this is done is that the agents collect the money. It's not the officials that collect the money. Because if I give you 2,000, and in less than 10 minutes, I get my PVC. Somebody facilitated that. Somebody made that happen. So when you say they are scammers, they, are, they actually work for those officials. And it is already things that are established in the places. So what we need to do is to, to find a way to deal with that and ensure that that middleman uh, process is, is disconnected. And, and I think that is important. I will, I will come back to that. And then for the, for the, for the back end, like I said in, in my opener, the, I did talk about the fact that we, we use expert analysis, uh, ob, ob, you know, observation, and, uh, and of course, the data uh, um, analysis. And the reason for that is that we didn't, being a qualitative tool, we didn't want to go into uh, very in-depth in terms of sourcing some of, of, some of all of these uh, things. But it's, it's sufficient to say that uh, I, I was expecting that somebody would say, oh, what about uh, security? We decided to get out of that, excused it, so that it does not, it does not conflict uh, all of this, because it is, it is actually a standalone uh, risk by itself. If we put that out, it will obfuscate. So we we actually have it's just three um, uh, these things that we use, and it's expert analysis. Um, sorry, expert interviews and um, the data analysis, and of course um, uh, those um, uh, things. And we use it to so that in the way it reflects for us in in uh, in manipulation of election. All of this is what we triangulated. To, okay. to come to the outcomes that uh, okay. we are going to be launching today. All right. So thank you so much. And I know both of you will have healthy debates off the air, and I wish you that healthy debate, both of you, off the air. Thank you so much for your time. We'll take a, <laughs> we'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Michael Wilson and Russell Deris. Give us updates on global life crop business activities. Stay with us. Adjust to the new realities for operating your business and engaging with your customers, let us help you transform your business into a digital powerhouse capable of adapting and taking advantage of today's opportunities. With our best-in-class array of digital solutions, you can conduct your business, receive payments from your customers, and perform transactions quickly, safely, and conveniently, because we've got you covered with the right people, technology, and service offerings. us today and let us take your business to its zenith. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. I'm about to serve better breakfast. If you're in Lagos, you need to see this. I'm not just streaming content, I'm just escaping traffic. Get more data to enjoy exclusive content. Dial star 141 hash now. Airtel, the smartphone oh. network. Haruna, this is Akman. Unduka, how do I want to do on election day? On election day, I'm going to take my PVC. When I retry, I did vote. I prove my go put my hand over to On election day, I'm going to take my PVC. When I retry, I did vote. I prove my 
I go put my hand over for Tinubu. People of Nigeria, make we all come out on election day and vote Ashiwaju Bola Tinubu as president. Make Nigeria for better. Make you put your hand for APC, the party where show broom. No forget to, oh, now broom you go put your hand in. Bam! On election day, I go take my PVC. When I reach where they vote, oh, I broom I go put my hand over oh, for Tinubu. Welcome back to the morning show here on the Arise News Channel. Now for business updates across the African continent, Rotu Sudiri joins us. Good morning, Rotu. Good morning, uh, Doctor. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, Ayo. Rotu, you still owe me money. Yes, I do. Morning, I do. I'll yes. pay. I'll pay off. It won't be like ways and means. I'll pay, <laughs> I'll pay off the debt. Um, look, your your conversation on voting made me think of an experience I had while in Davos. That I want to show it to you. I was. I went to get um, a prepaid SIM card. And this gentleman is the salesman in a store, and you can see my PVC on the, on the desk. I forgot my passport in the hotel room. So in order to be registered for that prepaid SIM card, to be able to use phones while in Davos, I had to register. So he looks at the card, and while he's, he, he used the machine, he scanned the front, he scanned the back, it was accepted, and you know, it registered me. He then asks, what is this? I said, oh, it's a PVC, it's a voter's card. He said, eh? You, you need a card to vote? Why? I said, that's how we do it here. How do you do it um, over here in Switzerland? And he said, we just use a passport. We have this, this conversation you just had, the entire the confusion, the fear, the risk of manipulation is all based on a flawed system. We have passports as a form of ID. We have driver's licenses. We have the NIN. We have the BVN. Students have student IDs in schools. Uh, workers have workers' IDs. Associations have IDs. Country clubs have IDs. You, the, the, the conversation that we should be having is how to liberalize voter identification in Nigeria to make this an easier process. There are way too many identification points in the country. It causes way too much confusion and is now leading to this conversation that we're having where we're all worried about INEC not being able to do this and INEC not being able to do that. Um, on our trip, I went with uh, Faith Orr, our, our, our correspondent, who is also um, our colleague, who she's from Scotland. They, any ID will work, anyone. And you can just vote. So, you know, why can we not adopt a proper way to rethink how voter identification is done instead of into creating all these layers upon layers upon layers upon layers that just just make the whole process difficult for Nigerians? Huh. Um, there was a 20th uh, Daily Trust dialogue. This is another issue again. Uh, Daily Trust dialogue where the presidential candidates, their plans were, were grilled. Uh, there were a number of solid private sector people like uh, Ibuko Awoshika, former chair of uh, First Bank, who looked at the candidates' plan. Now, the candidates didn't even attend. They sent in videos, right? Um, because I guess if they attended physically, they would have been flame broiled like a burger in front of all these people. They then looked at their plans, which are summaries of how they would do it. Here's a couple things that we said. Let's take a look at a quote from um, uh, Mr. Wushika where she said, all the candidates attempting to rule Nigeria have identified the problems, which is very easy to do, confronting the country, but none explained the strategy they would adopt to solve them. Uh, she continued and also said that with respect to this next first 100 days in office, candidates should tell us what they will do with the available resources, that is what is on ground, to solve the problems within their first 100 days in office. Is it not alarming that this is being said with less than 30 days to go. We are in trouble. Uh, Mr. Jibrin Ibrahim, who is a political science uh, uh, lecturer, he said, we agree that they have genuine intentions, but the current dysfunctional structure in the public sector was not designed to fight corruption and wastage, and none of the candidates have told us what they would do uh, about it. So there's that. Um, we move on to a new debit card that's being launched by the Central Bank of Nigeria and the Nigeria Interbank uh, Settlement System, that's NIBS, uh, which is called AFRIGO. This is a 
de an indigenous debit card that is supposed to be used for, uh, you're supposed to be used within the country, um, that's supposed to have a number of layers on top of it in terms of loyalty rewards for hotels, for airlines, for shopping, and so on and so forth. Uh, but for the, for the banks, for the um, financial ecosystem, they're looking at less operational costs since you look at your other cards that are, you know, uh, pro procured by, you know, foreign entities, there are cost, FX costs associated with that. So this new domestic card scheme is supposed to be uh, in line with that. And if you look at um, uh, India with Rupay and uh, Turkey with Troy and uh, Brazil and China, they all have domestic cards that are now numbering in the millions where, for example, I think in, in, uh, in uh, India, one or two out of every four individuals has one of those cards. So it's a high, high uh, scaling rates uh, with respect to what this card brings to the table. And then again, it is uh, uh, indigenous. Today is the 27th. Um, uh, Cold Stone, the, um, the restaurant chain, put out a tweet saying that due to the policy on the Naira notes uh, change, effective today, the 27th, they will no longer accept old currency notes in their uh, branches. They now sent out a tweet giving people other options, saying kindly make your payment transactions using the new Naira notes or any of our available payment options, and thanks for understanding. I think the, and today is the 27th, the 31st is Tuesday. I think the, for them, if they've got multiple branches, they want to stop on a particular day where they can gather all their old notes, take it to the bank within a, within a reasonable time on a particular business day, and then put them all away. Although some people have said, look, the, the notes are still legal. You shouldn't be doing that. Still on the notes, the central bank went all the way out to Ekpe, um, where they went to um, uh, spread awareness on the new notes. They've been doing this with respect to a number of rural areas. Um, I frequent Ekwe, by the way, fantastic fish market. Former governor Ambode of Lagos is from there, and uh, you get lots of prawns, snails, uh, great stuff if you love seafood. So they, they have been going across a number of rural areas and sensitizing the public with respect to the new notes, what needs to be done. Also, CBN has also deployed, I think it's got about 1.1, 1.23 million agents um, around as many rural areas in order to conduct these swaps in order so that we can get. So, so they are trying to move as fast as possible towards the deadline to make sure that uh, this, uh, this passes. Uh, and then, what else is going on? South Africa, um, the, they raised their interest rate by another 25 basis points to 7.25. Um, it was expected, I think, uh, two members wanted it to be 50 basis points. But here's the thing, they lowered their GDP forecast, growth forecast, to 0.3%. And Mr. Lesseta Kanyego, who we, 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 we spoke to while we were in Davos, said that ESCOM and the load shedding is taking almost two percentage points off their growth forecast. You need, yes. to, you need to understand what that means. Yes. That means that 0.3% if you add the two percentage, that's 200 basis points, they would have grown by 2.03%. That means if they're going to grow by 4%, it is, it, is, it is sizable. And it makes you think, if ESCOM, with all its problems and load shedding, can shave off that amount of GDP growth from South Africa, you know where I'm going. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what, what, where, what about us in Nigeria? Oh where God. we have been dealing with no power for how? That means we, I mean, that's how Africa helps do, do, do you even know what traffic takes out of our GDP? As we speak, the traffic right now. Outside, you oh, know. Oh, So, I, I mean, so, I mean, I, I'm excited you brought up the conversation on elections. In Switzerland, they use a passport. It should be that easy. Simple. Really. And another thing I have seen that we've not successfully done is harmonizing all the data points. I think, I, I think the poster child for this is the Adar system in India, yeah. which happens to be one of the biggest identification data point system in the world where everything comes together. So it's centralized, it's right? centralized. Right. But also the problem with Adar and elections, and, and I say India because India is the biggest democracy, and we are too one of the biggest democracy in Africa. The problem with that is the fact that more, the argument they make is that most people, other people on that system are foreigners. Okay. So you need voters card to, to, be able to say that you have to disaggregate and all of that. <laughs> right. And some people have also made that argument for Nigeria, but I don't think it's a concrete argument. They say, okay, the fact that you know foreigners to have need numbers in right. this country, right. you know foreigners to have um, you know other you know identification points and yeah, things no. like that. But also, you can actually one harmonize the data sets, then disaggregate. And you can disaggregate by using what we call code sorting. Mm. 
So you can put like a cold sort in front of every other person, foreigner that has the same data point, maybe like a driver like, okay, F or something or thereabout. Then you sort the code when you write out the algorithm because it is really possible to have a harmonized data point so that you can just present one data set and you'll be able to vote, you know, just like sort of like a social security number, which we have as our own name number here mm. growing. Mm. Secondly, I'm excited. South Africans are being honest with themselves. Because when you look at it, you cannot push out what ESCOM has, the damage ESCOM has done to the economy with the load shedding. And ESCOM is a reflection of how bad leadership is. Yeah, yeah. ESCOM used to be the poster child of everything managerially rights in Africa. Mm. But once the yeah, South Africans got in, you know what I mean, part of my French, ESCOM went kaput. Yeah, went down. And if 2% can be shaved off your from, GDP, from power, from power because you know everything surrounds around the economy. So if you fix that, and also think part of that is the fact that they're also looking that the boom in the mining sector that really propped up their GDP might not be continuous. Yeah. So you have to look at it critically. You'll be surprised, uh, Rutus, that uh, uh, cold uh, chain, right? Cold stone? Cold, cold stone. stone. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, cold yes, yes, stone. Yes. Yes. He's saying, look, we are no longer taking uh, old notes. Right. Because the deadline is January 31st. Mm. If you get saddled with uh, old notes right. beyond the deadline date, and uh, the CBN is very clear that there will be no extension, mm. then, of course, it makes business sense right. to say, please don't bring uh, uh, old notes. And I was citing the example of uh, a marital situation <laughs> in, uh, in, in Niger Price. State, in yes. Baku, uh, local government area, yeah. where the in-laws said, you know, the suitor should not bring a bright price in uh, old Naira notes. And I thought that that is a very that that is a that is a very reasonable choice in the matter. You know, people are no longer accepting old notes. You know, it has to be crisp, right? You know, because when you want new wife, you bring new things. But you know, I had wanted to ask you, but we don't seem to have plenty of time. This week, the United Kingdom mission in Nigeria said that they were taking off. Tariffs. So, some tariffs yeah, yeah, on yeah. Nigerian exports. Yeah. And everything sounded so altruistic. Yeah. So is this altruism? Uh, or is uh, it Brexit? Because it's about trade volume yeah. and all that we even have the capacity, mm. you know, in Nigeria to take advantage of some of these uh, measures. What do you think? Yeah, it's a, look, it's, every time you remove tariffs, it's a good thing because yeah. you are boosting exports. But it's the Brexit thing. The it's UK Brexit. is looking, yeah, they're looking around to try to see how they can improve trade relations. Uh, so it's uh, always, uh, you know, there's always selfish interest there. Are you, are you, are you, All right, very quickly, I just wanted to say that beyond Cold Stone, other so, so fresh, I went there, they weren't collecting cash anymore. Ah. And then also churches, I mean, some religious organizations have also said, like bring times, right? your, no, your offering or something, right, right. making the new notes or just transfer. <laughs> hey. But also talking about the, um, the, the domestic um, card, launched yeah. by the CBN governor. There was also, I was going to ask you questions around them saying that they would not pay dollar charges on your local card and on online transactions just right. for people. Because for those who have subscriptions, mm. you know, what's the impact on that no, very no. quickly? So what, what they said was that for transactions that are initiated overseas, international transactions, those FX charges will still be, set, will still be settled. But for what is done domestically, that is going to be settled in Naira, which is supposed to reduce, um, reduce FX costs uh, for them. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you very much for the right. clarification. And thank you, Rotis. Thank you. For Global Business Update, Michael Wilson joins us now from Cape Town, South Africa. Good morning, Michael. Uh, good morning. Uh, we'll take a look at the um, the Africa, the Asian and Asian Asia Pacific markets first of all. Um, they're still digesting the fact that uh, uh, that uh, Japan hit those that high inflation rate yesterday, and Australia is very, very high, uh, a, a little higher. Um, China still closed because of the lunar year. However, um, it should be noted that Chinese shoppers are actually heading towards um, luxury goods, particularly LVMH, for example, uh, reporting that they're very optimistic. They're seeing uh, revenue up 23%. So shoppers in China, um, second straight year of profits for LVMH as well. So ch ch um, shoppers in China really liking the idea. Of, of luxury goods. Um, India, a bright spot in an otherwise um, global uh, recession. Um, they're, they're, they're actually spending a great deal on infrastructure in that country. It's attracting foreign investment um, and it's also moving 
inexorably towards what what's described as a digital um, transition. Um, it's it's you know you look at the EU, you look at the United States. Not quite sure where they're heading. The view about India is of those economies in that region and, and indeed in the whole world. They're very heavily uh, represented at, uh, represented at Davos, and it could be. Listen to this. The, the feeling is it could be the third largest economy in the world by twenty thirty five. Uh, OK, so globally, smartphone shipments, they're actually sliding back. Um, the lowest now since 2013. Um, the thought is the pretty obvious one, isn't it, that uh, uh, 1.21 billion smartphone ship. But the, the thought is that the global economy is actually slowing down. Um, Apple is still the biggest shipper, the biggest smartphone maker, 72.3 million. Um, second to them is Samsung. Um, and, but their decline has been 15, over 15 percent. So, in other words, the global recession actually hitting uh, an, an accessory item like a smartphone really shows what's going on in the rest of the world. As far as the United States is concerned, um, a bit of a, a recap um, shows that, well, equities are ticking down, basically. Um, a little bit with Intel. I'll come on to that in just one second. Um, but there is, given those GDP figures yesterday, which, of course, declined um, on the last on the on the quarter before but the, the feeling is that the US might be heading towards some kind of a, a soft landing so the economy is still there it's just not quite as strong as it was in the third quarter of um, 2022 now back to Intel and their shares have been dropping expectations um, uh, they, they, they're very honest about this. They're saying that they, they expect another quarter of, uh, of losses um, and uh, their, 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 their actual revenues are receding after the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, shares down 9% um, and they have declined, which is unusual for them. They've declined to give a year-long forecast because they're saying there's too much uncertainty around to be certain about that. Uh, Elon Musk has been talking about Tesla, and he's saying that they're still winning in China. I mean, he's he's actually talking the company, uh, but he's not unaware of the fact that the likes of uh, Neo, Xpeng, Li Auto, and BYD—that's the one back, backed by Warren Buffett—they um, are very they're on on his heels straight away. And he doesn't. He's saying that they they are whilst they're winning in China, he's, he's not um, he's not sitting back about uh, the, the progress of his rival there because they work, as he puts it, the smartest and, and the hardest. That's the Chinese. Um, the emerging markets are attracting record investment, one billion every day so far this week. That's according to the, to the FT. Um, China, yeah, OK, uh, but there's still doubts about that. So emerging markets are attracting a huge amount of in interest from investors, much more than they've, 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 uh, they've thought about since 2021, apparently. Um, uh, what are those emerging markets? Thought you might ask me that question. It depends what you define by an emerging market. I mean, some it's, a market could have slipped back and then could be re-emerging. But we're talking about basically Argentina, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Poland, and indeed South South Africa. I know just been talking about um, uh, load shedding there. And of course, we've been experiencing it here. But um, still, the party may well be returning as far as emerging markets are concerned. Um, Turkey is doing something strange. It's trying to um, it's trying to defend the lira. That won't surprise you. It's fallen. Um, what's uh, the lira has fell about thirty percent since in, in 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 the past twelve months. What they're trying to do is to say to companies, please, will you swap your foreign earnings for lira? when you get it back to the country, and they're offering big incentives to do that. Um, inflation was 83%. It seems to be falling to about 63%, but it does look as though they have an enormous amount of work to do there. Um, I'm going to take you to the UK, Rolls-Royce Engineering, not the cars, engineering. This is the airline engines. Um, the new CEO, Tufan Ergen Biljik, has been saying that people at Rolls-Royce really need to understand that their rivals are gaining pace at the moment and they really need a massive restructuring. Um, that, that will be greeted, I'm sure, by groans as far as the Rolls-Royce workers um, in the Midlands are concerned here because they've had lots of restructuring over the past few years. And finally, oil. Um, it's getting an unexpected recovery, really, from those GDP figures from the United States yesterday. Again, not as high as the previous quarter, but the fact of the matter is the economy is not lying down there and there is a slightly improving sentiment about the about the the the, the uh, 
the, the, the spreading or not of COVID in China. That's the global view this morning. Real quickly, uh, there's a story right there that says 15 billion pounds was wasted. A lot of mammoth corruption in the UK. Corruption. UK and corruption are one now. 15 billion pounds was wasted for PPE at a time where there's a cost of living crisis. Do you know how much of energy subsidies that money will have bought? This is appalling. No, I, don't think any, I, don't, I don't think anybody does. I think what you were seeing here was a government, like most governments around the world, wondering how to re react very quickly to a crisis. And that money, that, that furlough money, I think that's what you're talking about, that, that, that disappeared um, fairly quickly. I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's disgraceful. And I, I find it disgraceful that the authorities have held up their hands and said, I'm really sorry about this, but we don't know where it's gone. I mean, how can you lose that amount of money uh, when it's not yours fairly easily? That's what governments tend to find, don't they? All right, let's go to China. And of course, no surprises there that the impact of the lifting of restrictions has touched the luxury, uh, you know, luxury industry, particularly as China shoppers are now traveling abroad, booking travels to go um, to embrace the life that they must have missed in the past three years when they were under COVID restrictions. Now, beyond the luxury shoppers, I mean, LVMH have said they didn't increase the share price um, just in view in favor of what's the impact of Chinese shoppers will be beyond the luxury industry. What other? Because we've focused a lot on you know increases in infections, deaths. But in terms of the positive um, impact on some industries, what are? Could you highlight a few of them beyond luxury? Uh, well, uh, the only reason I quoted LVMH is that they have actually come out with specific figures which clearly show that because it was part of their results. Um, and I, I'm sure that you know that 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 extra. Um, that, that, that extra travelling and, and tourism and the rest of it will, will echo in, in all tourist-sensitive places around the world. I think far more interesting would be to, I mean, sure that they are spending on luxury goods, as you quite rightly say, you know, released from the pandemic lockdown, etc. But I think really what I would be looking for, I mean, that's, that's fine. That, that's just a, that's a statistic. But what really we need to see in China is how they're tackling the, the, the real estate um, problems that they have, and also whether they're going to start respending on infrastructure and what the future of, of COVID in the country is after the New Year lunar celebrations. I would suggest that those are far more interesting and far more um, important figures to explore rather than the just buying of luxury goods. I mean, that, that kind of tourist spending is good and welcome throughout the world. And we welcome tourists in the UK, of course, as, as most of Europe does. It's, and I'm sure it's the same in your country, you know, with open arms, yes, please come and spend your money. But I think as far as China's concerned, that's fine. Uh, but I'd, I'd much rather know what the, what the government is actually doing physically and, and definitely to help things like the property sector, which is going through a tremendous uh, problem in China right now. Never mind the demographics. Let's not get started on that. We don't have the time. OK, two things. I wanted you to comment on Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's uh, speech. Uh, today on his plans for uh, growth uh, in critical sectors of the UK economy. Beyond uh, responding to criticisms from OBR, from uh, C CBI and others, uh, that the government has no long-term plan uh, for growth. Uh, what are we likely to hear from him? That's one. And then two, India has bright spot. How much of that is uh, hype or reality? Because, I mean, uh, you've indicated that India may overtake Germany and Japan and become the third largest economy in the world by the year 2035, the Center for Economics uh, tells us. Uh, but what are we comparing uh, India with, really? Because the comparison is with developing nations. Uh, are we comparing India with Sri Lanka, with uh, Pakistan, with Bangladesh, uh, its uh, you know, immediate neighbors? India first. Um, I, I think you're right to be suspicious about those. But we're not saying, or at least this is what the statistics are telling me, the story this morning is not comparing it with Sri Lanka or Pakistan. Um, it, it is saying globally, this, they had a big, big presence in Davos, and that, that was their shtick, that, 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 that that's what it's, it's going to be. It will be growing. Is it propaganda? 
who knows? I, I, I look at China, I'd rather look at India, and, and see to my, think to myself, yeah, OK, uh, that, that's the top level of things. But what about all the poverty underneath? What about the infrastructure underneath? What about the transport systems underneath? What about the sewerage systems underneath? What about, you know, general public infrastructure? I think India, I, I would posit a guess, has probably got a long way to go. And I'd rather measure it on their per capita income, say, in a year's time, as, as I'm sure you would. And then we'd have an idea. What will Jeremy Hunt say? Well, the car manufacturers have already said, haven't they? Because they're down to levels not seen car production since for 66 years. And what they're saying is we need an industrial strategy from the government. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure, and, and, and they're also saying, you know, we saw British Volt, didn't we, going into administration. That's a developing story, by the way. The Australians are still, as I understand it, possibly going to help them, as I reported earlier in the week. However, do we need a government strategy? Yes, we do. What normally happens to government strategies? Who knows? I mean, I'm not exactly sure that government's industrial strategy is the thing. What you do is you keep corporation tax down, you keep tax gathering down, you keep legal system up, uh, and you keep corporate, corporate identities and corporate brands fairly strong. Then you start to attract foreign investment. I don't think, I mean, you know, there will be words, no doubt, about a government industrial strategy. I do not trust the dead hand of government. And I'm pretty sure that the CBI may be saying this, but actually I would imagine a lot of their members in private are thinking, do you know what? Just make just make make the whole in the business environment good for entrepreneurs and good for business and then leave us to it. I think that's what we'd probably be saying. All right. Thank you so much, Michael Wilson. Have a lovely weekend. Uh, it's time for a short break on the morning show. Well return we'll have rising Alice Malo Feni. Join us to review top stories today's newspapers. Stay with us. One man knows Nigeria, understands the people, and knows how to get Nigeria back on the road to growth. His capacity to navigate numerous industries towards growth and expansion is tested and trusted. No one needs to show Atiku Abubakar how to move Nigeria forward through challenges and unto greatness. He already has a sure plan. A strategist, an entrepreneur, and job creator, Atiku Abubakar knows Nigeria, knows our people, and knows the work. Atiku, for sure. PDP! Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months. It doesn't matter if you run a salary account with First Bank or any other bank. Just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance, and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First bank. Lagos has amassed more wealth than any other state in the country to be the most comfortable city to live in. Now Lagos is earning 51 billion naira every month. But even with all that money, this is the Lagos you have now. Bad roads filled with potholes, poor drainage system resulting in floods during rainy season, incessant traffic congestions, increased environmental pollution, poor healthcare system, large-scale child begging, 
poor security and increased crime rate, impunity of state government officials, lack of clean drinking water, poor transportation system. After years of empty promises, Lagos is now rated as the second worst city to live in the world. How long shall we continue like this? Lagos is not working. We want our Lagos back. Vote Dr. Abdulaziz Olajide Adediron Jandor as governor of Lagos State. Chafueko, fight for Lagos. BDP power to the people. There are days when you think, oh, more, I don't try. Order a Glovo. Days when plans run longer. What if we order a Glovo? Or days where you can't control everything. Oh, yes, because on Glovo, you can order anything you want. Glovo, you order, we deliver. A reflection of the Nigerian never say die spirit. They never stay down. You're always thinking of how to improve. You're always thinking of how to move forward. My name is Emmanuel Ahimieho. I've been a civil engineer for 18 years. I'm the project manager of Obadana Kaba Road. The Obadana Kaba Road is 43 kilometer built completely of concrete pavement. We started work on December 2016. I remember when we came here, it was virtually lifeless. We're building a road that we know will need very minimal maintenance. It's a road that we don't need to rush back to in five years, trying to carry out major maintenance work. We don't need to import anything that we need on the road. They are all locally available materials. All the cement we use on this road is from Dangote Cement Factory, which is the largest cement factory in Africa. The sand is from the communities, so people from the community they end up becoming suppliers. Imagine supplying sand for a 43-kilometer road. It's a lot of money. There are things I've learned from building this concrete road that I never knew 10 years ago. And to be able to lead those people to achieve something worthwhile, something that is of value to them, to the community, to people who have never met us. And I am positive that the road will last most of the people who are building the road. Along this route, you have up to 12 communities. People have the confidence to open shops. Why? Because you know someone is going through the road, they sell their things, they sell their goods. That is more money for them. We have a number of eateries now, and you want to buy food along the road, you get fresh food, not food that are preserved. No, you get fresh food. So it is good for us, and it's good for the community too. The road is a lot more safer now for everybody, including Halima, including other travelers. So they have better road, lesser crime, shorter journey times, so a lot of advantages. I've had people who go through the roads and they stop to just say, well done. We are proud of what is happening here. We're happy that this is going on in Nigeria in our time. We can see it. They are proud of it. I think it has brought life back to the communities. I feel very proud, extremely proud, being a part of this project. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Joining us now to review some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is Arise News analyst Emmanuel Efeni. Malabite. Good morning, Ruben. Good, mo <laughs> Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Ayo. Yes, Malabite and action. Where, there is mal where you have Malabite, there must be action. <laughs> now let's start the review with this day, Nigeria's newspaper of record, the lead story in battle against independent monetary policies, House threatens a mifile. 
banks to lawmakers we are getting new bank notes dispensing through atms cbn sustained sensitization monitoring of cash swap policy naira redesign project six traditional rulers support ahead of january 31 deadline now it may feel it more, by now it should be getting used to threats to arrest attempt to arrest uh, as he's, he's go, as he goes about his job but uh, the naira uh, redesign and uh, withdrawal of old currency uh, well there's a problem the house of representatives want to speak with the governor of central bank they want him to come and throw more light into uh, what is happening but the, gov the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Bajabia Miller, quoting extant law, is saying that even after the deadline, those who have bank, old banks can still return them to the bank. Uh, Ruben is saying you have to do community reading, for those of you who are lawyers, community reading. Well, if we give not community interpretation, then <laughs> it means uh, even bandits and kidnappers who are keeping their was struggling to bring out their loot can come after uh, January 31 to deposit their currencies in the bank. But I ask, if you have currencies, what's stopping you from bringing them to the bank all this while? So, it's a question. But the problem, and I think CBM must take note, is that ATMs are not dispensing enough. Some ATMs are still dispensing old notes. As at yesterday, you see queues in various ATMs. And why is that? Now, the banks have limited withdrawal for a day per, per customer to 20,000 Naira. So if you want to buy stockfish, what 40 Naira in the market at Oyibo, what do you do? Those who don't have POS, they won't even countenance transfer. So what do you do? So bringing that limitation at this time when many Nigerians are trying to get the new Naira note, I think it's a problem. It's something the CBN and the banks must look, look at uh, and deal with. Because a couple of weeks ago when I started withdrawing, I was withdrawing to my heart's content. And even giving people like uh, Ayo who are finding it difficult to touch the new note, I'm doing charity all over the place. <laughs> so, <laughs> you won't let those rest with this your withdrawals. How much do you withdraw at any time? <laughs> 20,000 or 50,000. <laughs> but I think people are having problems with drawing notes. And I think that point has to be made. CBN and the banks need to address that quickly. Now, if we just look at other stories, of course, the Guardian newspaper reporting the same story. Stampede as Nigerians tackled CBN deadline on cash swap. Now, below the, the photographs be at the bottom of the Guardian newspaper, Ogoni, after seven years, after seven years, red, residents lament slow pace of clean up. We've made so much noise about this clean up, but it is very slow. Only last week at the FEC meeting, monies, billions budgeted for buying vehicles for this project. So I hope they will not be buying vehicles and leaving the actual job of cleaning Ogoni land. This is a test case for the government of Nigeria, not just this government, but anybody will be at the center concerning the cleanup of pollution in the Niger Delta. Now the uh, we just go straight to the uh, yeah the New Telegraph newspaper. New bank notes reps threatening to arrest CBN Governor Bank CEOs. Now the Nigerian Tribune newspaper, of course. Um, Naira notes National Assembly leaders to meet Buhari reps threatening Mifele with arrest warrant. While the new the Daily Trust newspaper candidates blueprint cannot solve Nigerian problem. Panelists have said, of course. Uh, wrote of stosh on this a short while ago. These panelists, they looked at the presentation of the front uh, runners and saying that, look, they identify the problems, but they have, they don't have it. The strategy, they don't have it yet. Well, I hope they have the team to work 
on the problems quickly because whoever becomes the president, we will not as accept excuse because the, our problems are well known, well documented. So if you are not finding solution with your team, whether you are doing as teamship or, or as individual, then there is a problem. Now, the Daily Sun newspaper elections, military wants troublemakers. And I hope those who are planning to cause trouble on election day will take note. The military will be on standby to help the lead agency, the police, when it comes to security matters on election day. Now, the nation newspaper, petrol crisis, PDP colluding with saboteurs, says Tinimbu, Atiku trying to pit Tinimbu against Buhari, protesters block beneath Lagos Road over fuel scarcity and high price of fuel. Now, of course, the nation newspaper put in, quoting Tinimbu and putting the right spin to the Abel Kuta talk, where it seemed that the candidate of the APC was criticizing the government of APC under the watch of President Muhammad Buhari concerning fuel scarcity and concerning the Naira redesign. Now, a spin is being put around that. Tinubu is not blaming the PDP. The party of the, the, the candidate of the ruling party campaigning like the opposition candidate. It's a different twist we are seeing now. Now, the foreign newspapers quickly, the Times of London, Prime Minister's foreign students plan to shore up economy. Yes. Now, foreign students is being considered by the rich uh, Sunak um, government to give foreign students more working time. Right now, they are pegged to 20 hours a week. But plans are on to extend it to 30 hours or even remove the cap altogether just to get more people to work. In the UK, there's a surge in vacancies, 1.3 million post vacant. Well, Richie Sunak wants to solve this in order to grow the economy, but that looks like an incentive for Jack Pais, Ruben, <laughs> Rufa, and Ayo. Well, I wanted to comment on these new notes. And this is your persistent report of your <laughs> withdrawers. <Yes. laughs> if you could share with us the size of these withdrawers. But on a serious note, yes. it's a very serious problem. We've, we discussed this earlier. Even churches are no longer collecting uh, some old notes. Some churches have said, oh, is your own church still collecting old notes? Because I saw a list of about four or five no. you know, churches saying from January 26th, Please don't bring old no, notes. Take we, your old notes. In my church, we follow the law. You are, you are still Our collecting. Our advisory is that all those who collect, uh, who are in charge, must deposit whatever they collect on Sunday by Monday. Elder. Elder. <laughs> okay, you will take it to, <laughs> to, to the bank. To the That's bank. the right thing to do. And the banks, you, according to one report, they've shut down their ATMs. No, that is and you go and deposit. You go and deposit. That's what we say now. Yeah. Whatever you collect in the church, you go and deposit. Old, new, go and deposit. The banks don't reject deposits. So really? those those who are rejecting old notes by Sunday, they are flouting the law. Because those old notes Even are still retailers like that are not collecting old notes again. Yes. Um, <laughs> families that want to give out their daughters and the marriage, they too have said, don't, don't bring old notes. I think families should just wait till January 31 <laughs> <laughs> before they collect any private We're out of time now. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Feni. It's time for a short break now. When we return, Aaron Akiri Jola will be here with Global Sports Update. Stay with us. This Naimeka, he like to the keep money for her. As CBN deadline don't the near so. This one now why is the maker? As he don't yet say deadline the near, he won't carry money good deposit for the right place. With access bank. It's time to spread your wings and fly. Reach for the sky. Even if the bank too far, now to go to the nearest access to that agent. Don't carry last with your money. Get up, get up right now, right now. Money where you deposit for access bank. Now money where you go make your mind rest. Well, well. 
let the money spoil for your hand, though. Ten million naira today, fifty zero naira tomorrow. Oya, oh, Musa, Shade, Oyin, carry your money go access bank or access to that agent. Where near you? Access more than banking. Introducing an all-time mega offer. Get over 50% discount in the Airtel Home Broadband Mega Offer. Buy a router for just 10,000 Naira and get up to 240 gigabyte or a MiFi for 5,000 Naira and get up to 125 gigabyte bonus data. More data, more you. Reliable Home Broadband Buy. Airtel, the smartphone network. Haruna, this is Akman, Unduka, how do I want to do on election day? On election day, I'm going to take my PVC, when I retreat a day vote, I promise I'm going to put my hand over for Tinubu. On election day, I'm going to take my PVC, when I retreat a day vote, I promise I'm going to put my hand over for Tinubu. People of Nigeria, may we all come out on election day and vote as Shiwaju Bola Tinubu as president. Make Nigeria for better. Make you put your hand for APC, the party where show broom. Not forget to, oh, now broom you go put your hand in. Bam! On election day, I go take my PVC. When I retire, they vote too. I broom, I go put my hand oh, for Tinubu. New Naira notes? Don't panic. Here's what you need to know. Ensure to make deposits of all old banknotes before January 31, 2023. To make the process seamless for you, all Fidelity Bank branches will be open till 6 p.m. on weekdays and 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays to allow for cash deposits only. Also, please note that bank charges on all cash deposits have been suspended by the CBN. However, charges shall still be applied on cash withdrawals. The new banknotes can be accessed at any Fidelity Bank branch nationwide from December 15, 2022. Old banknotes will remain in circulation till January 31, 2023, when they will cease to be legal tender, as directed by the CBN. For more inquiries, follow us on our social media channels or email us at true.serve at fidelitybank.ng. You can also call 0700-3035-489 or reach us on WhatsApp on 090-3000-5252. Thank you for banking with us. We are Fidelity. We keep our word. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. For updates on sports stories across the globe, Aaron Akirijola joins us. Good morning, Aaron. Yeah, good morning to you. Ayo. Good morning to you, Doctor. Good morning to you, Rufai. Good morning. Uh, let's add it off from the Aussie Open, still waxing strong in Melbourne. And let's talk about Novak Djokovic, who says he's feeling something special about the 2023 edition of the Australian Open, of course, you know he missed 2022, so thanks to all those controversies. So let's see, nine-time winner, hoping to get to a 10 final. So we wish him all the best. He's actually on a streak, and he'll be hoping to even press it even further um, later on today uh, when it takes on American Tommy Paul. And away from that, let's talk about some other results that have actually just come in. Uh, literally, he, um, one man, Stefano Titipas, will be hoping that... Maybe he might be able to avoid Novak Djokovic and probably play um, Tommy Paul. But he actually was able to uh, overcome Kachanov in that particular game. So kudos to him, I must say. And as, we actu as it actually stands right now, some of the results have actually come in. Because Rybakina also is in the finals after defeating Sabalenka. So it's getting to the business end. And this weekend... The Aussie Open will be tipping off, and the cutting razors will be on Sunday. 
And would it be Rybakina? Would it be Novajokovic? Would it be Stefano Titipas? We'd have to wait and see. But in the meantime, everyone still, everyone seems to be tipping Novajokovic to clinch a 10th Australian Open. All right, let's talk about the fourth round of the FA Cup. Some of the best managers in the EPL will be going head-to-head -head this weekend for the fourth round of the FA Cup. And it, it, it doesn't get bigger than... Arsenal and Manchester City. Later on tonight, both teams will be going against each other in the FA Cup fourth round with an opportunity to get into the quarterfinals of this particular event with the hope that this will be a mile marker because we know that aside tonight's encounter, Arsenal and Manchester City will still be meeting themselves in a month plus, twice in a month plus. So at the moment, Guardiola has this to say about the particular tournament and he says that... Arsenal are the best team right now because you can overlook a team that has actually garnered 50 points at halfway of the season. And you say we have to perform at our best level against this team. It will be difficult. And he's not mincing words because if we press it further, you get to see that Arsenal have always, in recent times, been able to overcome Manchester City in the FA Cup and the last two times that they've actually met has been quite difficult for them. But look at it, looking at that, of course, in 2017, Arsenal were able to overcome Manchester City two goals to one, Alexis Sanchez scoring late, late in that particular game. And also in 2020, in the semifinals, it was Pair America Boomerang's double. All right, Darmin, Manchester City. So I, I know you can actually smile with the hope that maybe this might just be Arsenal's opportunity be to hope. win another. Yes. Well, we'll have to wait and For see. The season, yes. All right, it's the cup competition season. Let's talk about Real Madrid and the Copa de Rey. As Real Madrid put to the sword Atletico Madrid on the day. And I must say that fantastic solo goals um, on the day just typified what Real Madrid were all about. Comeback Kings coming from behind after former boy Alvaro Morata had put them ahead. And no thanks to the red card that Atletico Madrid actually had, they had to labor heavily. It was 11 minutes to go before Real Madrid began engineering a comeback. And what a comeback it was. Three goals to one was how we actually ended. Kudos to the Los Merengues as they actually are marching on. Now, quickly, Samson Yebo Isiasia went to the appeal Scots with the hope of overturning his five-year ban from football, but that did not pull through. It's unfortunate he's still laboring to see how he can actually reduce this deficit, but the appeal scouts in the U.S. were not having any of that. And finally, all right, the uh, Sportsville Awards, they've actually reeled out uh, a number of people that will be recipients. Of course, the governor of Lagos State will be part of them, and also the governor of Biosa State, among several others. 4th of February, everyone seems to be gearing up in the sporting community for the Sportsville Recognition Award. Oh, yeah, that, that's a lovely one. Uh, but real quickly, uh, Aaron, I was just making a joke with Aya before yeah. you came in. I said, why is that the days they are going to beat Man City? That's when you appear. <laughs> uh, because this was also a short answer. I don't like, think I so. Told, the Arsenal is winning the league. But hey, you can't take it away. Uh, Pep Guardiola has done a great job with that City side. He's got a better head to head. The only time Arsenal really beat City is in the FA Cup. Let's see if they can do it this time around, but time will tell. But that Guardiola side is very pumped up, and you know they've got a Haaland in there. So it's going to make a good game to watch and to mm -hmm. see today. Djokovic, I have a feeling that Djokovic will nick it. I just have that strong feeling. Yeah. At first, you know, you said, oh, he wouldn't be able to go through that round, and I talked about, you know, other players and what they have done, like the likes of Annemore and the likes. Mm -hmm. But now he's, he's one foot in it. And he can probably nick No, but you can see that he's still heavily strapped. Uh, he's heavily, heavily, uh, he's, he's heavily his strapped. His left knee is still you know, heavily. His, you know, strap, uh, his left thigh uh, is heavily uh, strapped. Uh, Aaron, you forget a lot. Yeah. That courage is not the absence of fear. True. It's having fear and walking through the fear to get what you want on the other side. That's just it. All right. And what I see with Jokola is courage. All right. Okay, uh, Djokovic. Last year he made history at the uh, Australian Open. COVID vaccination. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this year, yes, he stands a chance to make a big history. Yes, he is. He's likely to get to his 10th final yes. and also win his uh, 22nd uh, Grand Slam, Grand Slam mm. to equal the existing record. But he's making a different kind of news. Last year was COVID. This year is about the uh, Russian flag. No, but he's because his father, him, but his father. He, I know, I know okay. what I'm saying. His father yeah. was seen in a video 
uh, you know, standing beside a man that was carrying the Russian flag with the image of Putin. Now, the Ukrainian <laughs> ambassador to Australia okay. is making big issue out of that. He says that uh, Djokovic's father should be expelled uh, from the stands, from the Australian Open, and that Djokovic himself should apologize and make clear his stand on the Ukrainian-Russian uh, uh, war. So that's the controversy there, but he hasn't said anything. I guess he should just focus on his, uh, on his match, his semi-final match today at 8.30 yeah. p.m. Yeah. against Paul, and then maybe he will get to the finals, as we all uh, expect. Mm -hmm. As for Samson Siasia, the second uh, district court of New York, yeah. in Manhattan, you know, uh, said, the Court of Appeal said, they don't think they have jurisdiction over the matter. Siasia went to the U.S., he says, well, because he got his license, his coaching license from New York, then, of course, as a U.S. Uh, uh, person, you know, the court should inquire into it. But the, the court declined jurisdiction. And in law, of course, uh, you know, jurisdiction is everything. Will they go back to FIFA? It remains to be seen. He went to FIFA the other time. Mm -hmm. You know, the live ban was reduced to uh, five, five years. years yeah. And uh, Eric Ten Hag can uh, beat his chest. The man that succeeded him in the IAS. He has been sacked for losing <laughs> seven matches back to back, back to back. After they lost yesterday to a team that is in the re relegation zone, they told him, okay, come and be going. You have done enough. <laughs> so he couldn't reproduce Eric Ten Hag said. Uh, Ten Hag has been so, there for a while, so it's understandable that just trading a coach into the deep end sometimes always has this kind of effect. Anyway. Are you? Are you? Yeah, I was just, just finally going to say that I know that we all, I mean, many people are projecting that Djokovic would take this one, but it would be wonderful to see Sissipas um, take this. It was, it's, he's going into his first Australian Open final, yeah. um, having beaten Kach, well, you know, Kachanov. Kach, Kachanov. And, um, you know, rooting for him, if he does win the Australian Open, then he will be number one seeded. He's currently number three seeded. So Sunday, whoever it is, uh, Tommy Paul, Djokovic, whoever wins tonight, is going to be an exciting, you know, match for the Australian Tom Open. Beach. A bit, uh, sure. Anyways, <laughs> you have thank to you keep my fingers crossed. Thank you, very, <laughs> thank you very much, oh, Tara. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, we'll be talking to our next guest, who will join us shortly. As you adjust to the new realities for operating your business and engaging with your customers, let us help you transform your business into a digital powerhouse capable of adapting and taking advantage of today's opportunities. With our best-in-class array of digital solutions, you can conduct your business, receive payments from your customers, and perform transactions quickly, safely, and conveniently, because we've got you covered with the right people, technology, and service offerings. us today and let us take your business to its zenith. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Yesterday I got a call from Glue. I won the three bedroom Pongalu. Yes, guys! Guess what? I want a car. I want a generator by participating in the festival of Joy Promo by Glow. Hey, you know, don't do this one for me. You know, to make sense to me with sewing machine. I won generator last year. This year, I won for us. It's a celebration like no other, with prizes like no other. 20 new houses to be won. 24 brand new cars. 200 sewing machines. 100 generators. 1,000 rechargeable fans. Glow Festival of Joy promo. Dial star 611 hash now. Papa, mama, brother, sister. This Lagos must work for all of us. Everybody, Jafu, Eko. Oh, yes. 
in Lagos people, papa, mama, sister, brother, auntie, plus including uncle them. Better don't land for Lagos State Gidiba. Money will be for Lagos State, then go use them for Lagos State. Wella, no more baba sope. Then no go chop Lagos State money. Nobody go pocket Lagos State. Then go take and build Lagos State, build road, build hospital, build houses. And now only one man fit do this job. He name na Abdulaziz or Lajide Adedirun Janto. He can't carry one of Bunga person as a deputy governor. Her name na Funka Kindele Jennifer. My people, what will they wait for? Make we vote for light, vote for change. Nobody can change where they vote before. This one not the original change. Hmm, how am I done to pay the pay? Everybody Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. The Presidential Campaign Council of the All Progressives Congress yesterday said its candidate, Bola Tinubu, did not mention, blame, or accuse President Muhammadu Buhari of being responsible for the current challenges in the country. Tinubu had, while speaking at a presidential rally at the MKO Abiola Stadium, Kuto, in Abel Kuta, Ogun State, said the lingering fuel crisis and Naira redesigned by the Central Bank of Nigeria were part of a plot to thwart his expected victory. In another development, the ruling APC had a depletion after one of the Presidential Campaign Council director, Hajia Najatu Mohammed, a chieftain of the party, resigned. Hours after her resignation, she was seen with Atiku Abubakar, presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, indicating that she had switched camps. However, the APC Presidential Campaign Council has accused Najatu Mohammed, a former chieftain of the party, of being a mole sacked by the APC PCC for incompetence. Joining us now from our Abuja studio is Hajia Maria Ibrahim Baba, a member of the Public Affairs Directorate of the Ruling All Progressives Congress Presidential Campaign Council, to discuss the campaign activities of the APC and, in addition, comment and clarify some of the allegations stated yesterday by Najatu Mohammed. Good morning. Good morning. Well, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Ajia Mirembaba. Well, as uh, Ayo pointed out, yesterday we had uh, Ajia Najatu Mohammed here, a former member of your party. And our principal submission was that the candidate of your party, your presidential candidate, is not a fit and proper person to be president of Nigeria. And she said a lot of things that I don't want to uh, repeat on television because we did that uh, uh, yesterday. What exactly is happening within the party, uh, with persons leaving the party, with uh, members of the party coming out openly to criticize the candidate, the candidate himself openly criticizing the policies of government? Um, good morning, Nigerians. As um, I was earlier um, introduced as Miriam, I am Maria Ibrahim Baba. And um, Maria. the issue you have raised about comments of Hajia Naja and other Nigerians, or criticism rather, we are in a democratic dispensation in Nigeria. Nigerians have the right to share, move, participate with people of their choices in different political parties. Um, criticism that are passed out to the public with good intention, without insults, insinuations, and trying to create um, disunity among people in Nigeria is not the right way. But criticisms are welcome as long as they are, um, as, if they have a good focus. 
In APC, we don't have any problem. Of course, we have triggers like that of Naja, as you have just mentioned, and she's been on air, and all the points she raised. Um, as a Nigerian, Naja Atu has the right to move from one party to another. But there are principles in life. Creating false information about individuals, especially people that are already out there that you have identified with in the beginning and accept, accepted to work with. If at a point in your life you discover, as she has mentioned, she was in London and had had about two, three hours discussion with our principal, that is our presidential candidate, inshallah, who will emerge by the grace of Allah, she had one-on-one. -on -one. How many Nigerians have that opportunity? But she had it. She discussed with him, as she claimed, and she assessed him and came to a conclusion that as far as she is concerned, as a Nigerian who has the right to take decisions at any step in her life, discover that to her, he is not capable for reasons she has given. She mentioned him being having dementia. Fine. Then she also said, she categorically asked him, what plans does he have for the North? And she said, he said he has nothing for the North and that he doesn't have a blueprint. Now, on her return to Nigeria with that perception, with that conviction that she does not believe in him anymore, the best thing she would have done is to move to whom she believes without, you know, insulting him publicly in the, in the media, saying all sorts of things, even referring to his medical condition when she is not even, she doesn't have a medical background, does she? Her assessment is wrong. But then on arrival back to Nigeria, she went ahead. With that decision at the back of my, her mind, she went back to the office and collected a letter of appointment to serve in the process. And then, of course, money has not been given to anybody. All our supporters, from top right down to the to the sugar cane seller, they have different ways of contributing. They go to places without demanding for money. We want to divorce ourselves in Nigeria from politics of money. Now, she collected her letter and then went and sat. And then suddenly she came up, just a few weeks to the election, and decided to move to another presidential candidate, which I do, we do not see any fault in that. But she should have done it quietly. And she should have also returned whatever benefits she's receiving from being an APC member. She mentioned she's a commissioner in the police affairs. She said that she does not receive any salary, which, is, which I will believe her. But I'm sure there are incentives that goes with it, even if you don't receive salary. Okay. So you see, it's unfortunate that you have decided and concluded that the presidential candidate you agreed to work with has dementia. And by the time you came back to Nigeria, you still went ahead to collect a letter to serve under that. Nigerians are not stupid. Oh. Nigerians are aware the politics of 2023 is different from the ones we have had in the past. So it's just a pity. From all indications, she has shot herself on the foot, all right. Thank which you is so most much, unfortunate. Let, let's move on to, because we have such a limited time and we want to get through a number of issues, including some of the work that you're okay. doing with the APC. But I'd like you to respond to yes. um, you know, the, the speech by your presidential candidate, Ashiwadi Bola Ahmed, you know, with the statement he made at the MK, MKO Stadium in Abel Kuta, Ogun State, which your party, through your spokesman, Mr. Bayo Nonuga, has come to refute, or perhaps, shall I say, clarify.
What he said is that the president did not, I want to read his statement, you know, as he said it, did not mention, blame, or accuse President Muhammad Buhari for the current challenges in the country. In fact, he said that uh, the sabotage they were referring to was carried out by some fifth columnists in the system, possibly working in cahoots with the PDP. There are a few concerns around these, you know, this statement, because what he was saying was that the candidates was trying to let the federal government know what is happening and who are the detractors. Number one is that the president, whom is under the APC, is the, is the, is the minister of petroleum, therefore has oversight of that industry. If he's saying that the PDP is responsible, along with some other elements, for the lingering fuel scarcity in the country today, is he saying that the Minister of Petroleum is not able to handle his ministry. Hmm. My dear, in Nigeria, we don't believe in clean competition, unfortunately. And these are the areas we need to change if we want our country to forge forward. We should give room for clean competition. You go out on the field with a three fair grounds for everybody. Go and compete. You win, you win. You don't win, you go. There's another time coming. But we, we, we always go by creating stories. My face could be removed and somebody else's face could be put on my, on my, on my head. This is a modern generation. We have all these social media, they can do a lot. Our principal, our presidential candidate, al Bola Ahmed Tinubu, did not say all those words people were now claiming he did. He didn't say it. And the issue of petrol shortage in Nigeria is not new. We have had it a lot in the past. In fact, worse situations. Things have improved. Last year, we had Christmas celebrations, and every filling station is free. We have well. We move around. There was no problem. These hitches come from time to time. And if it unfortunately comes at a time, when your enemies will use it against you, which is unfortunate. The petrol issue is not a deliberate thing by anybody. We did not say anything. We have taken it in good faith. You, you as a person, you can walk, you have eyes, you can see, and then you go and hit your leg and have a fractured bone. So what happens after that? You go and get treatment. But so let us really look at situations fairly and without being you know, emotional or try to be pulling down syndrome. This issue of petrol is not new in Nigeria. We've had serious issues in the past. It has improved with the coming on board of President Muhammad Buhari, and he's doing his best. A human being can never be 100%, but at least he has scored over 90%. Okay. So our opponents, um, our opponents are going cooking stories and putting them around. They are, all, they are not authentic at all. They are all false. Okay. Uh, Hadja, see, I, you had a right to reply, but I thought you were going to reply, but you've just only made one point. And I would like to, because she said a lot yesterday, she talked about the health of your candidate. You mentioned that mm -hmm. he, he, she was talking about the health. Is there anything wrong with your candidates? What's the medical record like of your presidential candidate? Have you met him? You know, Excuse what, what is it Excuse like? Me, no, hang on a minute. Let me of finish. Adja, I'm asking a question. Okay, okay. Adja, just proper civil player. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I'd like to also ask, I'd like to also ask that they said some people were, houses were bought for some people to be able to join the campaign. Because she made a lot of allegations. Secondly, do you know anything of such? Excuse me, the, the, senten the sentence is not clear. What did you say at the beginning? Adja, she said... That she said a house was bought for somebody to be able to join the campaign. What's your take on that? Secondly, thirdly, she also said that, you know, there's a lot of psychophancy around. And based on what was said in Abel Kuta Adia, do you understand the Yoruba that was spoken there? Because now you are saying nothing of such was said. Do you understand the meaning of... Yoruba, very good. Okay. Do you understand the meaning of... Do you understand the meaning of that? 
And do you understand that that's an allusion to... They use money to quench fire? No, no. That obviously, you don't now. obviously, you don't understand Europe. But what it means is that they've hidden Naira. And that's an allusion to the CBM policy supported by the president of the country. So these are the issues on ground. So it's obvious you didn't even understand the Yoruba he was speaking there. And probably you've not been interpreted to you. So those are the points on ground. Let's deal with the issues on, in all of this. What's the health condition of your okay, candidate, um, like she mentioned? Okay, fine. Yes. The condition of my candidate is um, excellent. If you watch all, our, all the presidential candidates, that have that are you know vying for the same position and you compare with our candidate i mean where hasn't he been in a, he hasn't sat for a day he's moving from pillar to post discussing with people meeting people finding out what they need their problems and all that so our candidate is in a very good condition to to take up that office i can assure you for that secondly I will advise our media houses to please engage in investigative journalism when anybody comes on air or to your studio and make any proclamations, make any, you know, make any comments, please, you need to really go out and do investigative journalism so that you come out with the facts before you now put it up out in the public. And this um, issue of psychophancy, well, I don't know. It depends of, on, on what you really mean by psychophancy. It has a, a broad spectrum, but I believe, and I'm, a, I'm part of the team, I am telling Nigerians that with our principal, he has, proved, he has proven it in the past, his antecedents when he was in Lagos, he has brought many people on board based on merit. So he goes out there to pick people based on merit so that they can come on board and work with him and forge this country forward. This country belongs to all of us. So sitting there somewhere and creating stories just to tarnish the image of somebody, I think it is wrong. We should stop. We should desist from that. Hidden agenda. Well, hidden Naira, as you said. I don't know about that. Um, I've been in the political field for quite a while now. Nobody has given me a dime. And um, almost of the work I do, I am doing it because I believe I believe in my candidate. I believe in him, and I know when he gets there, he will do the right thing. And about his uh, um, blueprint, the blueprint is, is ready. It's out there in the public domain. It took time to bring it together, and he has done a very good job, and it's out there. You can find out and get a copy. If you don't want to have one, I can bring you one, so that you go through and see his own blueprint. We don't, we don't um, compare ourselves with other uh, 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 aspirants. Everybody should go out there and do the needful. And then we go out to the field. And then Nigerians will now decide who they want to be there. But I am assuring Nigerians that. And I'm assuring you as well that Abola Ahmed Tidumbu is, is, is really ready to go. And well, he will, Ajia. inshallah. Ajia, what do you think of this general perception or assumption that uh, your candidate is not getting enough support from President uh, Muhammad Buhari. Yes, he has uh, showed up at uh, about three uh, campaign rallies. The last one in Bauchi, where he did not even make any statement. Uh, but uh, there's this perception that there's no enthusiasm uh, from the uh, villa, which is uh, APC uh, occupied at the moment, either from the president or even the vice president. Uh, what do you think of that? And then secondly, yeah. Uh, what are your concerns, okay. if you have any, now, about the fact that people can't get PVC, and yet INEC tells us they are ready? If people don't have PVCs, and in a report that we considered this morning, prepared by a group of uh, civil society organizations, we're told that voter uh, suppression should be expected in about 32 states. If we have voter suppression in 32 states, what will be the quality of turnout? Now, let's take the issue of Buhari, the president. The president is still the president of Nigeria, and he has work to do. And um, if you notice, he has already identified with a spread where and where he will accompany our candidates as support 
to show Nigerians that he is with our, pre our candidate. And he has been to other places. Even when we flagged off our campaign in Jos, he was there. He's going to be in Katsina very soon. He's been in other places. There are many more places he will go to. But as the sitting president, you don't expect the sitting president when he has work to do to, to leave office for the whole campaign period and start going out to campaigns. It doesn't make sense. He has to divide his time into these two very, very important areas. As the president, he has to attend to his duties. And then, of course, he has accompanied our, our candidate, and he will still continue until we get to the, the election period. I mean, the election day. That's that. And then about concern about PVC. INEC has done well. They have extended time. They've given it open. Up to this moment, people are still collecting their PVC. And we in APC have, have designed um, um, a chart whereby all stakeholders are back to their states. You don't run election in Abuja. I am in Kano. I have been in Kano. I only came here day before yesterday, and I'm leaving tomorrow. So in my state, we have 44 local government. I've been working, we've been working with NGO. We have the, 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 the state um, ESCO of our party. And then we have ICC. Recently, our coordinator has been appointed, General Lowell Jafaru Isa, because he has all it takes, the organizational, because if anybody you put in, an, in, a, in a leadership position does not have the idea of organization, then we are going to have problem. He is the best, and he has already started. I've attended most meetings that he has called, and we are on field. Now, every person goes back to their local government. And from the state, local government, to our councils, right to the voting boxes, we have members of our party that are there. And also, we have adopted another method whereby, you know, women have responsibilities. A mother, a wife, and then she can leave home. So what we do now, we go to rural areas. In all this, in fact, I am from Kano, so I'll talk for Kano. My other colleagues, we are comparing notes from time to time. We go house to house, door to door to talk to these women, to make sure that they have their PVC and they go out to vote, and we educate them. So I mean, we, we, are, we are not doing badly at all. We are doing well. So our opponents should not waste their time in attacking us. We don't have time to attack our opponents. We are focused. We have a mandate. We have duties. And we, have a fo we, we want to bring in the president of Nigeria. So we have work to do. So we're not going to burn our energy in trying to go and start fighting people. No, 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 no. We are not, we, are, we, we don't fall in that category. V very quickly. So Hadi. we are working. Yes, very quickly because we're, we're run fast running out of time. The first thing I wanted to just speak to you with regards to your statement around the president being too busy, you know. Would you not say the same thing about other state actors? For instance, the Minister of State for, um, for Employment, Mr. Festus Keyamo, has been on the campaign trail and even serves on the PCC. That's Mr. Festus Keyamo. Can you hear us? You see, I didn't get your, I didn't get your question. So I'm, I'm talking about the, 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 yes, the busyness of Mr. President. And others have called mm -hmm. also that Mr. Yeah. Festus Kayamo, who is a serving minister of state, has been able to find time. I know obviously his workload mm -hmm. cannot be compared to the president, but at least has been able to find time to not just follow the presidential candidate to different places, but speak on his behalf, tweet, and just, in fact, people have asked if he's still able to manage his, um, you know, what is being paid for as a minister of state. So I would, and then also with regards to the president's performance, I'd like you to assess it because you're asking us to vote for the APC for another term. And uh, people have said, well, the APC, all of the APC's government, we're currently, even though you say the PDP is responsible for the fuel queues, but we have a lingering fuel, fuel crisis. We have have debts, um, that, uh, possibility of seven, seven trillion naira debts being inherited by the next, um, you know, president. Why should we vote the APC? Can I talk now? Yes, please. Are you good? Now let's talk about the president being busy. I mean, of course, every president is busy, but then there's something we call division of labor. 
That is why you even have deputies. You have um, people to support you here and there. The president cannot do everything himself. So he assigns uh, certain things that others can do. We operate with division of labor. So the president, of course, is busy with his office. But that will not bar him from going out to support us in the field when we are going for presidential uh, campaign. He has done that, and he'll continue doing it until the end of the, 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 the elections. Now, let's talk about Festus. Of course, Festus is, has his chambers. He's, he, he has his chambers. He's the minister. Yes, and then he has an appointment now with APC. I, Maria Ibrahim Baba, I'm self-employed. I have time. That is why I was co-opted into this section of the uh, under Festus. There are assignments that are assigned to me, which is one today I'm, I'm handling, and there are many others. So you see, the fact that somebody has an office that he's running doesn't mean he will sit there 24-7. He will delegate. He will give duties to people. Huh? One hand does not carry a house. And when they go and deliver, of course, he will get the credit. So Festus is doing his best, and he's sharing his time logically to areas. And any time he sees an area that needs more attention, he attends to it. So please, let us be fair. Let us not be judgmental. He who wears the shoes knows where the shoes pinches. So all the officers that were appointed and placed in places, you now mentioned Festus in particular. Festus is doing a very good job. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sent me here to come and handle this. So please, my dear, uh, my prayer for Nigeria is that we look, we become focused and cast our vote for our candidates so that Nigeria will be a better place for all of us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ajia Maria, uh, for joining us on the morning show. We we'll take a short break now. When we return, Ojinika Ope will be here with details on what's trending. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Imagine your wallet can be everything. Well, almost everything your bank is to you. That's exactly what First Money Wallet is. First Money Wallet from First Bank is another swift and seamless way to bank from your mobile phone. It doesn't matter if you have a First Bank account or not, nor the mobile network you use. Everyone can open a First Money Wallet, and it's very easy. Your phone number is your account number. With First Money Wallet, you can send money using just a phone number, receive money, pay bills, buy airtime and data for yourself or someone else any check balance. You don't need a bank account at all or BVN to enjoy the boundless possibilities First Money Wallet offers. All you need is a registered phone number and you can fund your wallet easily through your first bank account or any bank account and debit card. What's more, First Money Wallet is highly secure with fingerprint technology and PIN. And when you need cash, just walk up to any First Money agent near you to withdraw money. No smartphone, no wahala. Just dial star 894 star 1 hash on any phone. So so it doesn't matter if you live in the city or the remotest part of the country. With First Money Wallet, your transactions are easy, seamless, and secure. Download the First Money Wallet app now. Input your phone number and follow the prompts, or simply dial star eight nine four star one hash. All money now on First Money. You first, First Bank. As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat. So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the roar alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all. Get 
Recovery Plan for Nigeria. Vote Atiku and Okoa 2023. PDP Power to the People. Been running my business on my own. Trying my best to get it to the next level. But I really need some help to get ahead. I know just what to do. I'll vault it for my loans. Overdraft. Step by step to my dream business. We vault. Vault is the answer. Salary earners. Entrepreneurs. Your loans with no collateral. Quick hey. sign up. Zero paper work. Step by step to your dream business with Vault. Vault is available to individuals, SMEs, and corporate customers. Download Vault by Polaris Bank from the Google Play Store or Apple App Store to get started today. Coordinator, Tinebusha Timazam for a State Campaign Council, Senator Kabiru Garba Marafa, OFR CON, Marafa Ngusau, cordially invites all APC members, supporters, and well wishers in Zamfara State to attend the party's presidential candidate rally that will see the presentation of His Excellency Chief Ashwaju Ahmed Bola Tinubu and His Excellency Al Haji Kashmir Shatima as APC presidential candidate and running mate, respectively, in the 2023 general election to the people of the state. The event is scheduled to take place as follows. Date, Saturday, January 28, 2023. Venue, Trade Fair Complex, Bypass, Gustavism for State. Time, 10 a.m. prompt. Chief host, His Excellency Bello Muhammad M.O.N. Matawalla Maradun Shetiman Sokoto, Executive Governor, Zamfara State, and Coordinator, Northwest Presidential Campaign Council. Chairman of the event, His Excellency Honorable Abdulaziz Yari Abubakar, Shetiman Zamfara. Former Executive Governor, Zamfara State, and Chairman Zamfara State, ABC Gubernatorial Campaign Council. Special guest of honors, APC National Chairman, His Excellency Abdullahi Adamu Trakin Kefi, Director General, APC Presidential Campaign Council, and Executive Governor Plateau State, Chief Simon Lalong. Special guest, all APC governors in Northwest Zone, National and Zonal Executives of APC, National Zonal and State APC stakeholders. Host of the event, Al Haji Tukuru Umar Damfulani Maikataku, APC Chairman, Zamfara State. Announcer, Honorable Ibrahim Maigandi Damalik Gidanguga, Chairman Publicity Subcommittee, Tinibusha Tima Zamfara State Campaign Council. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Joining us now is Ojinika Ojiokbe with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jinix. Happy Friday. <laughs> you're quiet. Thank God it's Friday. You know what you're doing, no problem. How are you, TGI? I TGI. love that you're always happy on set. I, uh, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Yeah, and you I'm always good every time I look forward to it. <laughs> good morning, Rufai. How are you? Jinix. Jinx, okay. <laughs> How are you? We're fine. Happy Friday. Right. 
Yes. Well, all right. Good morning to you viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. <laughs> In the United States, five fired Memphis police officers were charged on Thursday with murder and other crimes in the killing of Tyree Nichols, a black motorist who died three days after a confrontation with the officers during a traffic stop. The officers, who are all black, each faced charges of second-degree murder, aggravated assault, aggravated kidnapping, official misconduct, and official oppression. In Iraq, 14 people were sentenced to death by hanging on Thursday for their role in the Islamic State group massacre of hundreds of army cadets. In 2014, the massacre, one of the worst committed by the Islamic State, saw the extremist group abduct up to 1,700 mainly Shiite cadets from the Majid al-Tamini airbase to execute them. In Nigeria, the country's central bank on Thursday launched the Nigerian National Domestic Card Scheme, an initiative to boost the country's payments landscape. The governor of the Apex Bank, Godwin Emefele, at the virtual launch declared that dollar charges on all domestic cards and online transactions will not be permitted and assured that the domestic card scheme will provide opportunities to integrate the informal segment of the economy, reduce shadow banking, and bring more Nigerians into the formal financial system. Then, the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, took the party's presidential campaign rally to Abakaliki, the Eboin state capital, where he promised commitment to restructuring and accused the All Progressives Congress of deceiving Nigerians. APC had promised the same. Did they do it? They didn't do it. They abandoned the issue of restructuring. They are a very deceitful party or alliance. Very, very deceitful. Finally, under sports, basketball stars on Thursday marked three years since the tragic accident that claimed the lives of NBA legend Kobe Bryant his daughter Gianna and seven others after their helicopter crashed on January 26, 2020, just 14 miles away from their Thousand Oaks destination. At the time, Kobe was four years into retirement after winning five championships with the Los Angeles Lakers over a 20-year NBA career. On May 15, 2021, Kobe was inducted posthumously into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. Kobe Bryant was born on August 24, a day now celebrated as Kobe Bryant Day and also called Mamba Day, coined from his nickname, the Black Mamba in Los Angeles. Dear Kobe, thank you for being the best husband and father you could possibly be. Thank you for growing and learning from your own mistakes. Thank you for always trying to be better. Thank you for never giving up on us. Thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you for our family. Thank you for our daughters, Natalia, Gianna, Bianca, and Capri. Well, let's begin what's trending. The All Progressives Congress presidential campaign rally in Ogun State, in which the party's flag bearer, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, alleged that powers that be were behind the fuel crisis and the scarcity of the new Naira notes to scuttle the election continues to generate mixed reactions from a cross-section of Nigerians, some who have said that Tinubu blamed Buhari and the APC-led government for the alleged sabotage while Tinubu's aides have come to his defense. Some have said that Tinubu was only drawing Buhari's attention to saboteurs possibly working in cahoots with the PDP. Others say he was referring to the governor of the central bank, Godwin Emefele, for allegedly imposing undue hardship on Nigerians with the CBN's cashless policy and the newly redesigned notes. On Thursday, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Bajia warned that he will issue a warrant of arrest on Emefele if he ignores the summons of the House over the deadline for the withdrawal of old Naira notes from circulation. The Central Bank Act under Section 20 allows the Central Bank to change the legal tender. 
But it also says that even five months after, three months after, two months after, even in June, on an old note presented to the bank shall be redeemed by the bank. That point needs to be made to the central bank and to the public. The refusal by the CBN or managing directors to heed the invitation by the House of Representatives is evidence of a blatant, blatant disregard for the well-being of the Nigerian people who are their customers. It is also an insult to the authority and prerogatives of the People's Parliament. Therefore, if by the end of today, there is further disregard to the summons of this house, I will, without hesitation, issue a warrant to the Inspector General of the Nigerian Police to compel the attendance of the CBN and or managing directors who fail, refuse, or neglect to respond to the summons by the House of Representatives. Well, a member of the Media Directorate of the All Progressives Presidential Campaign Council, Biodun Ajiboye, was on our nightly show, Primetime, on Thursday, where he described the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefele, as a saboteur and claimed that the APC flag bearer, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, may have been referring to the CBN governor as one of those sabotaging the election. He spoke with Charles Anyangolo. Is Emefele not a saboteur, to be honest? I don't understand. Okay, Why therefore, would you suggest okay, that he's a sabot? I, I, that's what I feel, and I have a right to no, my feeling. No, no, but feeling. on what basis? The basis you, is very clear. That? Why are there so many errors to redesign the Naira? Why are there so many mistakes? The ink today, the Naira is wrongly cut tomorrow, the de delay here, delay there, everything appears very, very unprofessionally managed. Why, so, is it, why is that? So I, I don't understand the so point. So now, the point I'm making is that if you say, if you come to me to say that Ashwa, you spoke about the design of the Naira, right? And, I'm, and you, you infer, like many of your colleagues have done, that he was referring to Buari. And I'm saying to you that he doesn't have to refer to Buari. He could rightly refer to Emefile. Yeah, but, but, uh, but the Emefile... And if he refers to Emefile, he will be justified. But, Why but, will he be justified? Emefile was his competitor as the primary. Yeah, but President For instance, Buhari has come out so, to give his full support to Emefile. And to what policy, Emefile has done policy, with the redesign the policy, of the night. As a matter of fact, that Emefile contested the primary was wrong enough to have made him lose his job. Well, but Buhari felt, look, it is not important to make him lose his job. So he didn't lose his job. I'm saying that Emefile standing in that position, who has eyed the position of presidency of Nigeria once, could not have taken any action that would ease the electoral process. I am challenging Nigerian government to see it in that direction. We don't know. Emefile cannot marshal actions, plans that will make elections free and fair if it comes within his purview. And we can see the way he's dealing with the Naira. That apart. I'm here to clarify in, an, um, in on mistaken terms that Ashwaju was not referring to the president, he was not referring to the government. He was referring to saboteurs who are hoarding money, hoarding fuel, trying to make sure those things are not available to ease electoral process. And that fact must be very, very, very clear. Well, this is such a a huge conversation going on right now in Nigeria. I mean, is it that the APC media aides have not come together to organize their thoughts on what it is that Ashiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu was trying to say in Ogun State? Now you hear this media aide saying that is a mefele that Tinubu was referring to. We hear Bayon Onuga saying that, you know, it might have been, um, you know, people that were working with the PDP trying to sabotage the election. I mean, this is completely unacceptable, these conversations that are going on at this point. Dr. Abati. Well, apparently it's a season of uh, comedies, comedy of errors. <laughs> they will make a statement. They will come to the public themselves to interpret <laughs> the statement as if other people are deaf and dumb. But I, as I always say, after February 25, March 11, I, I guess there will be some calm, you know, uh, within the environment. Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Tinubu said, powers that be. Yes. 
when you say powers that be, simple dictionary meaning of it means that the authority in charge of a domain at a particular time, who is in charge of this Nigerian domain at this particular time that the phrase powers that be can refer to. Simply, the APC administration, and to the extent that the box stops at the uh, uh, desk of the president, President Muhammad Buhari. It was a statement, there's something also called innuendos. The innuendo, the direction of the innuendo was very clear. But it is good to see that, uh, you know, the spokespersons have work to do. <laughs> After their principal, you know, has issued a gaffe, they get <coughs> hypertensive and they go to the media. They want to change the what everybody uh, listened to. Okay, even if he says he was referring to uh, Emefele with regard to the uh, uh, Naira policy. Well, that policy is not a policy from Emefele's uh, bedroom. It's a policy for Nigeria under the watch of an APC government. Emefele does not run a, a personal domain. He's a CBN governor, he's central bank governor of Nigeria. Okay? And the president himself has come out, not once, not twice, to say that he supports what his central bank governor has done. Go and check section 18, section 19 of the CBN Act. The only person that the CBN governor has to refer to for redesign and for some other activities the is the president of Nigeria. And the president himself has, has not said he has, not, uh, uh, he, he has disowned uh, uh, the uh, Naira redesign policy. That is number one. Number two, is it a Mayfield too that is in charge of West Cassidy? <laughs> I think I really don't understand this. Okay? A Mayfield is not in charge of West Cassidy, is it? Because he, he also mentioned West Cassidy. He also said people are trying to sabotage him. Powers that be trying to sabotage his campaign. But we, and then he said, let's vote them out of power. The Mayfield, as CBN governor, does not rely on the electorate for that position. The only people you can vote out is a government. OK? So these are the issues. People should just uh, try to uh, you know, uh, 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 be, be, be educated. And then uh, 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 finally, at the end of the day, you may say that even if you are the candidate of a party, because I've had some people push that argument, that as a presidential candidate, you have freedom of expression, and that uh, you know, Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Tinubu, even if he criticized the government of the day, that he has a right to do so. Okay, freedom of expression is a, is a constitutional right. Except that the irony here is that he was the same man who said he brought uh, Buhari into, uh, into, power. into power. After the man had lulled the first time, he lulled the second time, he lulled the third time, and in fact, he even wept on television. He gave him the handkerchief and uh, cleaned his face and said, come and do this. <laughs> and now he turns around and he says, first car city, Naira and all that. So you see it, some people have correctly said, this looks like some kind of self-indictment, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but it's good uh, that they are, you know, in less than 24 hours, they are trying to protect and do damage control right. and put a spin on it and put lipstick <laughs> on, on the attack. I'm going to take you on damage control, uh, mm. Rufai and Ayo. Let's take that, uh, another story so we can discuss all of that. Social media was awash with reactions on Thursday after the organizing secretary of the All Progressives Congress in Lagos State, Ayodele Adewale, in defending the controversy surrounding bullion vans, cited at the residence of the APC flag bearer. Bola Ahmed Tinubu, a day before elections in 2019, said they missed their intended address. He spoke right here on The Morning Show. Let's take a listen before we take some reactions. On the other question of the bullion van or no bullion van and all of that, I think that matter has been put to rest. There was no money in the bullion van. The bullion van that even came uh, missed uh, the, uh, the address to have come there. Okay. It missed the address to have come there. There are some companies that have high staff that pay their staff with cash, okay. right? That bullion van missed his way there. Okay. And it was not invited by Ashwaju or anybody. All right. Ninth Sense wrote, three contradictory lies in less than a minute. Missed directions, empty bullion van, companies that pay staff in cash. 
or an empty van not meant for him, you sure do a lot about what is inexistent content was meant for. At least, make up your mind on a script and stick to it. Well, John J. Omojua wrote, the idea of spin is to make it believable. Better to ask what law was broken, whose bullion van was stolen, ETC, than to say bullion vans missed their way to enter into a VVIP's house. Respect your job, your employers, and your audience. Think through your responsibilities. Well, Kabiru wrote, <clears throat> it's getting clearer. One, Tinubu mistakenly shared a house with drug dealers. Two, bullion vans mistakenly found their way into Tinubu's house on the eve of elections. Three, we mistook Tinubu's bulaba for a gaff instead of a foreign language. Yes, it's getting pretty clear, Rufla, Rufa, isn't it? Oh, gee. <clears throat> all this violence you are sharing, there is God. Though. I mean, we, we sat through this yesterday yes. to hear the analogy of a bullion van mistaking its way. But another question I wanted to ask, but you know, the producer will say there's no time, mm -hmm. was that if the bullion van got there by mistake, I didn't know the bullion van was empty. So well, did, he, did he check it? There are all the questions. But we know all these things. Now, you know, I said something the other day. I said, Iran, Baro, Funro, Lori, Iran, Kimbe, Kisoro. So we all know how all of this happens. It's political spin. Just like the political spin that is going on now. And I want to ask you a very honest question. Why is it that there are 18 political parties, Vibe of Bread? Why is that it's only the one political party that is shouting about this Naira policy? Why? Why is it only them that their presidential candidate is talking about it on the campaign trail? Other people have been campaigning, they've moved on on this Naira. Why is it only one party? And why is the only one party that some of their members are moving forward to arrest the CBN governor? Dr. Bati, like you stated out in the law, the law is clear. Mm. The president gets to say so. I mean, and not gives a nod to any monetary policy as stated in the CBN Act. In fact, for those that have forgotten, let me remind you that it is not a mefele you should go and hand. Leave a mefele alone. Face the president in Ukwa Stone. If you want to talk to me, talk to me by yourself. You remember when Mr. Charles Soludo tried to make a policy of uh, redenomination of the currency? The president stopped it. So it's the president that has the right to be able to stop it. And when you say the powers that be, that means you're trying to call us a fool to our face like we don't know who the yeah, powers that be. Absolutely. You are attacking President Buhari, attacking. <laughs> as what he has blocked, is he blocking your way? All right, I uh, really All right. I mean, unfortunately, APC is seeming like a party of contradictions, yes. particularly with the statements that they release. First of all, with the issue of um, Paul Ahmed Tinubu's statement on a Mefiele freedom of, ex and then you know Mr. Bayo Onoduga saying that he was, uh, and the APC um, spokespeople saying that he was speaking about governor a Mefiele of the CBN, whilst other people say that is a freedom of expression. Which should we take? <laughs> if it's a freedom of expression to speak against their own party, then why are they now saying it's a Mefiele and the PDP? That's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. The second contradiction was yesterday with the bullion vans. As you've mentioned, it look if you saw the pictures from there on the day of the election. Ashwaji Bala met Tinubu spoke to this thing. So either um, um, Comrade Adewale didn't watch that video or he's received another memo. Then why did it take them four years to tell us that it was a misplaced ad um, 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 address? Very well said. Too so suspect. Ayo. Thank you all for your great analysis on what's trending today. Well, that's all I have for you on what's trending today. I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay, just before we go, may bullion vans <laughs> miss their way <laughs> to, into your compound. Amen. And may th those bullion vans not be empty. Yes. Amen. Have it? No. <laughs> they can, miss, they can miss their way. Bullion, Listen, full bullion van coming to Dr. Batis. Please, house. Amen. amen. And that's amen. all on today's edition of The Morning Show. Rotu Sodiri will be here next to take you through Global Business Report. Stay with us. It's the Arise News Channel.
there is only one place that the world will come to run on Saturday the 4th of February 2023. Over bridges, waterfronts, running across 10 kilometers and 42 kilometers of asphalt. Access Bank Lagos City Marathon will be targeting 100,000 runners from around the world ready to flood the streets of Lagos. The 10 kilometer race will set off at 9.30 a.m. at the Grace Court Garden Events Place, Durasimi Eti, Lekki Phase 1, while the 42 kilometer race will set off at 6.30 a.m. in front of the iconic National Stadium Surulere. And both races will finish on top of the sandy shores of the stunning Echo Atlantic City. From Oshodi to Owuru, Alakbere to Admiralty, Ikoi to Echo Atlantic, the race is routed through the warm, meandering feet, blistering streets of this historic city. So what are you waiting for? Get ready to push beyond the limit. Access Bank Lagos City Marathon 2023. Make it count. My people, ha! my name is Emeka. Mekus Kamat. Let me get all this moto. I don't learn my lesson. Somebody come buy moto for my hand, carry big, big money, come give me. Now, when we get bust, then my eye open. I don't know that 419 be. Now, when EFCC, bam, bam, then they come bab me too. Now, he make me, they warn you, all of them, I want to do business like me. Where they carry big, big money, when well, I go, sometimes I go carry transfer, carry bring back. Yeah, they could have shut my eye. Because <laughs> the special control unit against money laundering, when they call SCUMO, then that one say, if the money pass 5 million naira for individual, yeah, no collect them. If he pass 10 million naira for company, no collect them. Can I go where? Bank. If you not do them like that, 250,000 naira for every day where this offense happen. <laughs> or they go suspend your license. Or they go cuckoo, shut them down. Mata quarter for your hand. No talk say, I no one you. This message is from the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. Nigeria, now we got the FCC, not the party, now one man be a at last, the elections are here. Let's turn out en masse on election day and vote Ashiwa Yubola Tinubu as president of Nigeria for a renewed hope and a better Nigeria. Vote APC, the party that shows a broom. is power. Information is currency. Trust us to tell you what you need to hear. Welcome to the program. You're with Arise News in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Breaking news, exclusive interviews, unrivaled analysis. It's you, the audience, who drives our agenda. We tell the stories that inform you, the stories that are important to you, and the stories that are about you. We are not every news channel. We are Arise News.
Hello and welcome to Arise News. You're watching the Global Business Report. I'm Ruth Sodiri, coming to you from Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines across the business world today. Intel shares drop on weak quarterly results. Big tech still facing a lot of issues. Stripe hires Goldman, JP Morgan, to explore a listing. Adani Group exploring legal action against Hindenburg. And uh, Senegal President Macky Sall says Africa needs to learn to feed itself. But is that easier said than done? It's the Global Business Report. Do stay tuned. All right, Asian stocks up for a sixth straight day. Uh, we've got fresh gains in Hong Kong-listed technology stocks, the Shanghai Composite Index, the Kospi in Korea, and the aforementioned Hong Kong, and the Nikkei 225 all up. Uh, crypto stocks, though, heading in the opposite direction, still bearish. Uh, but Bitcoin above $21,000, uh, Ethereum falling back to $1,578, uh, Binance Coin and XRP also down as well. Dollar looking up against a number of um, exchanges, uh, up against the euro and the pound, uh, but down against the uh, Japanese yen. Oil prices also up. Bit, uh, rather, Brent crude, 88.32, West Texas Intermediate, 81.75, natural gas down. Uh, core consumer prices in Japan's capital, leading indicator of nationwide trends, rose 4.3% in January from a year earlier, marking the fastest annual gain in nearly 42 years and keeping the central bank under pressure to phase out its economic stimulus. While the government's energy subsidies starting next month will likely moderate price gains from February, the data heightens the chance that inflation will stay well above the Bank of Japan's 2% target in coming months as companies continue to steadily pass on higher costs to households. Japan and the Netherlands are set to join the U.S. in limiting China's access to advanced semiconductor machinery, forging a powerful alliance that will undercut Beijing's ambitions to build its own domestic chip capabilities, according to people familiar with the negotiations. U.S., Dutch and Japanese officials are set to conclude talks as soon as Friday uh, on a new set of limits to what can be supplied to Chinese companies. Uh, Gautam Adani's firms are preparing a detailed response to Hindenburg's report, which triggered another drop in the shares today. The document was, quote, devoid of facts, according to execs who spoke to investors. But Bill Ackman said he found the Hindenburg report both highly credible and extremely well-researched. Shares of Adani Group's companies have lost more than $30 billion in market value in less than two sessions as a sell-off were sparked by the U.S. short seller Hindenburg Research scaling report, uh, which deepened uh, today. Intel's December earnings showed significant declines in the company's sales, profit, gross margin, and outlook, both for the, quor full, for the quarter and the full year. Earnings came in at $0.10 cents per share, adjusted compared to $0.20 cents per share expected by analysts, and revenues also declined 32% year-over-year in the quarter that ended December 31st to $14.04 billion. Expectations were $14.45 billion. It's the fourth consecutive quarter of falling sales as the market for personal computers retreats from the COVID boom. Digital payment firm Stripe has hired Wall Street banks Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan to explore a public listing, according to two sources familiar with the matter, which spoke to Reuters. The company is also considering a private market raise to provide liquidity for employees. The Wall Street Journal reported earlier in the day that Stripe had approached investors to raise at least $2 billion at a valuation of 50 to, 55 to $60 billion. Wells Fargo uh, Chief Executive Officer Charles Scharf's uh, total compensation for 2022 was unchanged at $24.5 million, the Wall Street Bank said in a regulatory filing on Thursday. His compensation consisted of $2.5 million in base salary, $5.4 million in cash incentives, $10.8 million long-term performance share awards, and $5.8 million in restricted share rights, according to the filing. The fourth largest U.S. lender posted a 50% decline in its fourth quarter profit as it racked up more than $3 billion in costs related to a fake account scandal and boosted loan loss reserves for a potential economic slowdown. Later today, UK Chancellor of the Exchequer is set to announce a raft of new measures to tackle low productivity and boost the stagnant economy. Central to a new measures will be ease of doing business enhancements, which exploit exit from the European Union. One of the such measures is freeing the city of London's giant insurance firms from EU rules on cash that must be kept in reserves. For more on these headlines, we cross over to London. We're joined by Arise Business Analyst, Bodhi Oshosumi. Good morning, Bodhi. First, the UK, what exactly are we expecting from the, uh, that chancellor uh, later today to boost productivity? 
Good morning, um, Rotus. Well, indeed, the priority is, is on reducing inflation, like we know. Of course, focusing on growth, uh, industries like digital technology, green industries, advanced manufacturing, and it tries to set out a long-term plan to tackle uh, poor productivity, arguing that Brexit can be the catalyst uh, for prosperity, even though the numbers so far uh, are proving otherwise. The UK is the only G7 economy with GDP still below uh, pre-COVID levels. And it was a slew of bad news uh, this week. On Monday, the Confederation of British Industry warned that the UK is lagging behind rivals on green growth. On Tuesday, the insolvency firm Begpiece uh, Trainor said the number of firms on the brink of going bankrupt jumped by more than a third by end 2022. On Wednesday, the Independent Office of Budget Responsibility told the government that it had overestimated the prospects for medium-term growth and that it planned to downgrade its outlook, leaving Mr. Hunt with less uh, maneuvering room or fiscal space ahead of his budget this week. And only just yesterday, car firms warned that UK has not got a strategy to attract manufacturers. So it goes on and on, and definitely uh, the Chancellor had to come up with something we expect expecting uh, some measures, for example, uh, fresh support to make Britain the world's next uh, Silicon Valley. You've heard that uh, almost uh, 10 times before. Um, and more specifically, the EU era solvency two rules, which um, uh, of course, has to do with cash reserves uh, for insurers. is going to free up more money uh, for insurers to be able to invest in UK infrastructure. According to what we hear, as much as £100 billion of extra private investment could be available in areas such as clean energy uh, from uh, that uh, amendment. Will this be the greatest move to ease doing business in the UK to attract um, investment? The bottom line is that UK doesn't have the fiscal ballast to replicate the huge uh, clean energy subsidies in the US Inflation Reduction Act, but there could be some room without risking industry stability in sensitive sectors like financial uh, services. As if this was not uh, difficult enough, Liz Truss is expected to break her silence uh, also maybe later today or tomorrow, joining other Tories arguing that the tax cuts she proposed were right, but she didn't get the political uh, backings she needed. Although we've heard that um, Hunt is not likely uh, to introduce uh, any tax cuts, uh, even though there's a lot of pressure uh, to do so. But um, clearly it's going to be an interesting uh, speech. And uh, Intel, uh, what do you make of their uh, earnings uh, that was just released and the main highlights? No, we heard China didn't do well at all. That was the worst geography for, for them. We know why all the many headwinds uh, in, in China in 2022. And uh, of course, the demand environment is also has been deteriorating and for some reason intel hasn't been as strong in um, say uh, mobile mobile devices shipments of pieces fell 28 percent in the december quarter that's a huge drop from a year earlier after a 15 year over year decline in the September uh, quarter. So it's just a lot of negative news. Forecasts are suggesting any comeback of the chip industry is still far off after saying they expect a loss in the current uh, quarter. Also adding that the next revenue revenue release would be the smallest quarterly total since uh, 2010. The bulls, of course, still say Intel maintains a strong position as, as a leader in, in, in its technology niche. It invests heavily in R&D and this trend will continue it's made many smart acquisitions to accelerate its AI and automotive uh, offerings capabilities. Um, and in, the interesting thing also is, is that if you look at um, Asian semiconductor stocks uh, today in Asia, the, the rose, I think this essentially dismissed the very pessimistic outlook that um, Intel uh, may have uh, precipitated. And uh, many are saying even if demand for PCs is declining, demand from industries, including autos, is strong and cloud computing chip prices are also said to be growing. But having said that, um, Intel uh, closed up 1.31% uh, yesterday. But if you look at after hours, they really went uh, badly. They, they, they were down um, about 8%. And as we speak, I'm trying just to open uh, my terminal. As we speak, they're down 9.04, 9.04% uh, in pre-market trade. So based on that, is this a good time for Stripe to be exploring a listing? What do you make of this decision? Uh... 
Well, I, I don't think it's a good time, but um, if somebody is going for listing at this time, they must need the, the, the money. Um, Strive had laid off a lot of employees, 40% of its staff in November. Um, in 2021, they attempted a round of fundraising. Then they were valued at $95 billion. It went down to 65 billion. We understand this time it's now 55 to 60 billion. Of course, investors are going to be wondering: uh, Is it is this a downward um, a trend over, or should they just wait? The timing for tech is is bad, just like uh, we all know. But it's maybe it will get um, uh, worse before it gets better. But um, many have avoided going to the market because of the mood and the volatility that has been hammering uh, stocks. But um, it could be a sign that the current woes in the broader technology space are indeed uh, going to be short-lived. But um, let's wait and see. Uh, Stripe may have missed the window to go public and get a good price. But um, even if they go now, I doubt if uh, they're going to get um, what they want. All right, we'll see how it works out. Arise Business Analyst Buddy Oshosumi, thanks for taking us through the headlines. We appreciate your insights as always. You're watching the Global Business Report here on Arise News. We'll have more for you after the break. Should Africa, can Africa feed itself? Stay tuned. reflection of the Nigerian never say die spirit. They never stay down. You're always thinking of how to improve. You're always thinking of how to move forward. My name is Emmanuel Ahimieho. I've been a civil engineer for 18 years. I'm the project manager of Badana Kaba Road. The Obadana Kaba Road is 43 kilometer built completely of concrete pavement. We started work on December 2016. I remember when we came here, it was virtually lifeless. We're building a road that we know will need very minimal maintenance. It's a road that we don't need to rush back to in five years, trying to carry out major maintenance work. We don't need to import anything that we need on the road. They are all locally available materials. All the cement we use on this road is from Dangote Cement Factory, which is the largest cement factory in Africa. The sand is from the communities, so people from the community, they end up becoming suppliers. Imagine supplying sand for a 43-kilometer road. It's a lot of money. There are things I've learned from building this concrete road that I never knew 10 years ago. And to be able to lead those people to achieve something worthwhile, something that is of value to them, to the community, to people who have never met us, and I am positive that the road will last most of the people who are building the road. Along this road, you have up to 12 communities. People have the confidence to open shops. Why? Because you know, someone is going through the road, they sell their things, they sell their goods. That is more money for them. We have a number of eateries now, and you want to buy food along the road, you get fresh food, not food that are preserved, no. You get fresh food. So, it is good for us and it's good for the community too. The road is a lot more safer now for everybody, including Halima, including other travelers. So they have better road, lesser crime, shorter journey times, so a lot of advantages. I've had people who go through the roads and they stop to just say, well done. We are proud of what is happening here. We're happy that this is going on in Nigeria in our time. We can see it. They are proud of it. I think it has brought life back to the communities. I feel very proud, extremely proud being a part of this project. Introducing an all-time mega offer. Get over 50% discount in the Airtel Home Broadband mega offer. Buy a router for just 10,000 Naira and get up to 240 gigabyte or a MiFi for 5,000 Naira and get up to 125 gigabyte bonus data. More data, more you. Reliable home broadband buy. Airtel, the smartphone network.
Welcome back to the Global Business Report on Arise News. About 20 African leaders, international institutions, and other delegates started their Feed Africa Summit in Dakar, Senegal, on Tuesday. The summit was headlined by the African Union and the African Development Bank as a follow-up to the first meeting back in 2015 when the Feed Africa Strategy for Agricultural Transformation in Africa was proposed. Here is President Macky Sall of Senegal saying Africa must produce more food instead of relying on imports and aid. Now, the African Development Bank has proposed a 10 billion dollar uh, pledge over the next five years to turn Africa into a breadbasket. And we're joined by Sanyade Okoli, CEO of Alpha African Advisory, uh, to talk about this. Good morning to you and Happy New Year. Good to see you Good again. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome well, back, Richard. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so that quote from the president of uh, Senegal, uh, we keep, what do you make of it? Because we keep hearing this over and over again, Africa must feed it. So is it easier said than done? Yes, but you can't refute what he said. We right. do have to feed ourselves. Okay. The, the, we're essentially facing a global food crisis, mm. and we cannot remain dependent on other continents for food yeah. when they themselves are potentially facing a crisis. Yeah, yeah. They're not going to prioritize sending their reserves to us, you know, in, in times of difficulty. Um, so we do have to do it. But, you know, I was thinking about it and you know as you read around the topic i think part of why people like you and i struggle is we have these political leaders they go to these events they speak words which are grammatically you know sound yeah great vocabulary yeah, yeah. but sounding terribly academic and quite frankly insincere right right and so you just think, oh, for goodness sake, you know, there we go there again. again right. But it is a necessi necessity, yeah. and now more so than ever. Okay, the United Nations says about 275 or 278 million Africans are facing a food crisis. Now, um, much of where, go ahead. That's one in five Africans, by one the way, five, to, yeah, right. to put, to put the, it in the as context. a ratio, yeah. Yeah, but the, the, the nations, where they live are facing these heavy debt burdens. So how do you how how do you feed all these people when you can't even get your economy to oh you're facing debt and you can't you don't have the money to feed them basically. I mean how how do you get out of this? So maybe let's shift how we look at it. Yeah. It's more a case of how do we enable our citizens to feed themselves. Okay. We know the government can't feed us. Right. But what the government needs to do and what you know across every sector the private sector people are crying out to say, create the enabling environment. We don't need you to do everything. Because quite frankly, most times you're not even well positioned mm. to do so, either, either from the financial resource or the human resource. But create that enabling environment that will enable us to do what we need to do. Okay, um, another thing, another quote from Mr. Maki Sal. He says about 60%, uh, this arable land thing, it's, and Mr. President Buhari here in Nigeria has said it, where is, okay, yeah, we have the potential with about 60% of arable land here that is not exploited. It is paradoxical that we still need to import the essential of what we need. I, I want to ask you about what is needed to extract the food from this arable land that they say is in such vast abundance? Um, the technology needed, the labor. Again, I ask, is it, is it easier said than done to just say we've got so much land and we should just be producing food out of the ground? Can I tell you what I believe is the root cause? Please, we're always right, so please tell me. <laughs> I think it's we, what we face on the continent is a mindset issue. Okay. In the first instance, we don't even believe in ourselves. Fair, okay. We don't believe that we have what it takes. We have the, the capacity to feed ourselves. Mm. If we don't believe, we're not going to execute. Well, so you think we have the potential and the capabilities to do so? 60% of the world's arable land, one continent. Right, has it. Right. Of the, the, the uncultivated arable land. Yeah, yeah. We have people young people, but have we trained them? Mm. Have we given agriculture the level of significance and importance in our countries to make 
our teenage children, when they're choosing subjects, think that I'm going to study something related to agriculture. Do they find it cool? Do the young people? But that's what I mean. That's what so I mean. that's, that's the mindset. mindset. Oh, okay, mindset. okay, okay, okay. And because we haven't elevated agriculture, when we think of agriculture, we're still thinking of oh, sustenance. And, you know, and all exactly. Those. Right, right. The technology exists. We can buy it in, even if we don't have it. Yeah. It's more a case of, think about it, um, Rutus, think about your life. Yeah. When you decide you're going to do something and you set your mind to it and you let your beliefs line up with your intent, gotcha. you achieve you're, 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 you're it. Line. Similarly, if we do the same, but again, part of it is our political structures, right? Because we have political structures that ensure that, and I use the word ensure deliberately, yeah. that those who are good at politics get to the top, but they're not necessarily the best leaders. Right. They might just be the best politician. So that means they are not equipped to provide the leadership required mm. to enable us to fulfill the vast potential that we have. Okay, great. Very, I agree. Well said. What about this climate change matter? Because much of the continent is being impacted by climate change. You've got droughts, you've got floods, you've got all, this, all these issues. And the answer that is being proposed is an energy transition to renewables. But yet, the African nations that are being you know, disproportionately impacted by climate change are fossil fuel dependent. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, to some extent, resistant to the energy transition that will get them out of the climate change. So how, how, do, you, how do you get out of that? OK, do you know why they're resistant? Well, I know jobs. 3% yeah. of the global emissions come from the continent. Mm. 3%. And they're thinking, guys, you, have, but yet the continent is most impacted, impacted by, by climate, climate change. change yeah. So it's like we haven't had, quote unquote, our fair share of emissions right. to enable us to develop. We are suffering the greatest impact. And you say transition, we're not yet in a place. Having said that, mm. climate change isn't an, um, um, addressing and taking steps for, um, for the energy transition, etc., it's not a nice to have; it's a need to have. Right. So it's not like oh, we we now have to, we must now achieve our own fair share of global emissions. No, unfortunately, mm. it is what it is. But we have to say, given where we are, what is best? And part of that, what is best, is yes, it is energy transition. Yeah. But as I said, we're not in the position to do it at the same rate as other parts who, quite frankly, are the ones polluting the <laughs> environment. Like the Chinas and the U.S.'s of this world. We're out of time. After the next time you have me on globalization and protectionism and self-sufficiency, we got to talk about that when we have you on the show. Sayan Okoli, CEO, Alpha African Advisory. Always a pleasure having you to discuss these issues. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. You're watching the Global Business Report on Arise News. We head to Harare after this discussion to look at the global economic outlook for Zimbabwe. Do stay tuned. Day. On election day, 
I go take my PVC. When I reach where I devote to. I broom, I go put my hand over for Tinubu. On the last show day, I go take my PVC. When I reach where I devote to. I broom, I go put my hand over for Tinubu. People of Nigeria, make we all come out on election day and vote as Shiwaju Bola Tinubu as president. Make Nigeria for better. Make you put your hand for APC, the party where show broom. Not forget, oh, now broom, you go put your hand there. Bam! On election day, I go take my PVC. When I try I they vote, oh. I broom, I go put my hand oh, for Tinubu. This Naimeka, he like to keep money for her. As CBN deadline don't they near so. This one now why is the maker? As he don't yet say deadline they near. He won't carry money good deposit for the right place. With access bank. It's time to spread your wings and fly. Reach for the sky. Even if the bank too far, now to go to the nearest access to that agent. Don't carry last with your money. Get up, get up right now. Money where you deposit for access bank. Now money where you go make your mind rest. Well, well. Don't let the money spoil for your hand, oh. Ten million naira today. Fifty zero naira tomorrow. Oya, oh, Musa, Shade, Onye. Carry your money go access bank or access to that agent. Where near you? Access more than banking. All right, welcome back to the Global Business Report on Rise News. Zimbabwean investment banking outfit Morgan & Co. will be hosting a 2023 economic out webinar later today. Members of the research and investment banking team will be discussing the opportunities and headwinds facing Zimbabwe uh, as economy. It's a whole lot going on. They have elections as well. Joining us from Harare to give us a preview of the outlook is Batanai Matsika, head of research at Morgan & Co. Batanai, Happy New Year. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to see you again. Um, your your cover of your reports you got two lions uh, uh fighting and you're saying there's a there's a battle for supremacy help us out what does this mean is this is zimbabwe battling other african economies for economic supremacy or is it battling economic headwinds what, what does the cover mean with the lions okay so it, it speaks to the uh theme that we've set out for the economic outlook report which is the battle to be Lion King. I think this is the, the major trend uh, or political trend that's going to, to uh, take shape in 2023, where we're seeing that uh, we, we will be having the presidential, uh, presidential elections. Of course, we have two main um, uh, political parties here, ZANU PF and Triple C. So that's the main theme that's going to shape strategy uh, in uh, 2023. And of course, we foresee a, a lot of um, instability uh, being driven really by election related uh, you know, issues. Yep, we've got uh, elections here in Nigeria as well next month, as a matter of fact. Uh, let, let me take a, a look at some of your some forecasts for Zimbabwe's economy for this year. So we've got, what do we got? We have the IMF at 3.6. We've got uh, you folks at uh, Morgan & Co. at 2.5. I believe the Ministry of Finance over in Zimbabwe is looking at 3.8% growth. So, I mean, so your forecast is lower. Um, uh, tell us why yours is, you know, less... You you know, lower than the other two and what you make of their forecast as well. And what are the triggers, I guess, for growth for this year for Zimbabwe? Okay, uh, I think one of the focus that's not there is actually uh, one by the African Development Bank. Uh, I think, you know, it's sort of closer to ours. Uh, they're looking at around 2.6, uh, they're about. I think, you know, it's worth noting that, uh, um, of course, you know, there are certain sectors that have uh, shown uh, a bit of recovery, especially if you then consider in the mining area where gold has actually helped, you know, growth. 
uh, and also agriculture and you know, accommodation sectors. But our concern or our own valuation uh, is that you know there will be uh, productivity uh, related constraints. I think the emerging risk that we're seeing now is that of uh, power outages that's going to uh, affect uh, capacity utilization uh, in key industries. But there's also the issue to do with uh, 2023 to say that there are uh, other risks uh, that will come through, especially when they then consider you know, inflationary pressures that will come with uh, unplanned uh, government expenditures. So we think that overall the output will be um, you know, quite constrained uh, in 2023, uh, and also some of the uh, global risks uh, could come in and uh, affect uh, growth prospects. All right, you talked about the elections, uh, and uh, we've got, of course, the two main candidates, the president and I guess the main uh, opposition party candidate. Uh, I, this is featured in your report. What's, you know, what's the impact, I guess, with the, with the elections, which is this year, right? And also, you know, the follow through, transition, power transition, like vile, so on and so forth. How's it going to affect things with the economy? So we've evaluated, uh, you know, the, 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 the political environment and what we see, especially in yesteryears when we uh, had elections, I think, in 2018, uh, our elections were sort of uh, marked by um, some violence, pre- and post-election uh, violence. Uh, uh, and as a result, we expected that there will be um, some um, instabilities, uh, so some issues that will come through, especially when they consider, uh, you know, just ordinary business. So we expect um, uncertainty, uh, uh, especially when you then consider you know, foreign participation on local capital markets and even just FDI. So uh, a lot of you know, investors usually in election years, they just you know, uh, have a wait and see approach. That, so that would affect some deals uh, and also uh, the ability of the nation really to attract the much needed capital. So we, th we feel that, you know, that these elections would uh, actually have a negative impact in terms of uh, just doing business on a day-to-day -day basis. But is uh, President Emerson uh, Manangwagwa, is he favored to win? I know he's facing, I guess, uh, Nelson Chamisa, who is, I guess, the opposition party uh, main candidate. Is, is who, who's favored here? Is the president favored to, be, uh, to win? Yeah, so you, you, you have to look at the dynamics. So if you're looking at ZANU-PF, this is a revolutionary uh, party. It has been there for quite some time. And uh, usually, uh, you know, um, older people are aligned to, 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 uh, to ZANU-PF. And also they have a very uh, huge following or a stronghold uh, in the rural areas. And then if you then look at uh, Chamisa, youthful, uh, uh, a lot of, you know, you know youths, um, you know, below the age of 35 would be sort of uh, aligned to triple uh, C. But at the same time, if you then look at trends, young people don't really uh, register to vote. So that could work um, you know, against triple uh, C. So we're saying that it's going to be a very tight race. Uh, I think uh, no, this is one of you know, any, uh, interesting elections. Uh, and uh, in that event, we we'll then expect um, you know, some contested results and delays and things like that. So we're saying that uh, 2023, you should expect a, a bit of friction uh, on the political front uh, before we see stability maybe later on in the year. All right. Now, talk. you mentioned those productivity constraints uh, earlier. Um, I think, what, power? Yeah, okay, here they are. Capital constraints, policy shifts, and electricity shortages. Can you quickly take us through these three? So capital constraints, the, the way that we, we analyze productivity within the uh, general economy, we use... Uh, the, the Cobb Douglas uh, productivity uh, function, uh, which is basically states that you know, capital or the quantity of capital is quite key when you want to drive productivity. So if you're looking at 2023, we don't expect a lot of um, inflows in terms of uh, investments that will come through. Uh, and even uh, lines of credit, we don't expect that to, to come through uh, from a productivity point of view. So we're seeing constraints there. Policy shifts, uh, we expect a lot of policy shifts because politics will take center stage. Uh, I think in yesteryears, we'll see that, you know, um, uh, you know political de de decisions uh, tend to override any sort of um, uh, no economic uh, sense. So we, we expect um, you know, that to, to, to affect um, uh, productivity uh, levels uh, by the end of the day. So there's also the issue 
people of um, uh, power outages also speak to the uh, to the COP Douglas productivity function to say that uh, technological advancements uh, and the availability of um, you know uh, power actually adds on to to uh, output. So we're seeing a lot of constraints in terms of. Um, power uh, and uh, in the region generally. So it's not just Zimbabwe, it's uh, even South Africa, we, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, issues on power. So that will affect capacity utilization definitely and output will be on the low end. And that is why we have a focus of around 2.5%. Thanks for that. A section of your report talks about the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, monetary policy ineffectiveness and a lack of central bank independence. Uh, can you get into that for us? I think if you're looking at a lot of central banks, especially in, in Africa um, and, uh, of course, um, including Zimbabwe, they lack independence from political in, uh, interference. So you find that, you know, um, a lot of times certain decisions, um, uh, you know, are passed uh, simply because, you know, they are aligned to uh, a particular regime. So they lack that independence. Um, and as a result, a central bank may not be able to actually, um, you know, deliver on its, um, you know, uh, objective of uh, inflation targeting or macroeconomic stability. So the lack of uh, political independence uh, and also the lack of credibility. So if you're looking at the Zimbabwean case, um, right now we're seeing that there's a growth of a shared economy where a lot of transactions are happening in cash outside the formal banking system, simply because there's a lack of confidence in the banking sector and in some of these uh, policies. There's also a lack of effective communication. Uh, I think in terms of just a forward guidance, we've not seen uh, a lot coming through, especially from the, the RPZ. Uh, and also there are no consequences for bad outcomes. Uh, so, so in international, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, international central banks, you know, if they failed, if governors fail to, to meet certain targets, they have to report or uh, give it, you know, sort of um, an explanation. But when it comes to a lot of central banks in Africa, there are no consequences. So we see governors failing to, to meet uh, targets on inflation and nothing happens to them. So all those factors um, uh, actually add to our point to say that, you know, it's going to be very difficult for the RBZ to maintain stability or to execute uh, on its uh, key mandate. Okay, speaking of mandates, you've got uh, inflation, as you mentioned, is one of the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe's uh, uh, mandates. Uh, your forecast, this scary forecast, 208% by December 2023, uh, the pressure is still there that keeps inflation high in uh, Zimbabwe? Yes. So one other uh, important driver, we're seeing that there are foreign spillovers uh, within the local economy. So. You no, know, the the Russian uh, Ukraine uh, crisis um, has affected you know um, the local economics in the sense that uh, fertilizer prices are on the high side. Uh, we're also looking at uh, things such as uh, you know uh, just general food prices, uh, wheat, and also energy. So we're going to experience that that risk uh, from a local economics uh, point of view. But we are seeing that um, the inflation environment or the the the, the current environment. No, it's also uh, going to be uh, driven by you no know, uh, political interests. So there's a tendency during election years, uh, you know, to just um, for unplanned government expenditures. So that will push uh, money supply growth, um, and as a result, you know, uh, we're going to see a lot of pressures. But also the lack of confidence in the uh, local currency unit. Uh, I think the, the economy generally now we're looking at 80 to 90 percent dollarization. So there's no confidence uh, in the local currency, and therefore that will you know, um, sort of uh, push uh, our inflation numbers up. We're basically focusing an average inflation rate of around 175% uh, right up to December 2023. Gosh, triple digits. Uh, real quick, how about stocks? How did Zimbabwe stocks perform 2022? What's the outlook for stocks uh, 2023? So mid-year, uh, last year, 2022, we saw a, a raft of measures, uh, as you follow, um, that affected you know, trading activity. Uh, of course, there was an increase in capital gains tax, uh, a lot of measures that you know, uh, limited the, the flow of um, ZWL liquidity. So we saw that the market actually derated in real terms. Uh, we're looking at um, a, a slump in, in the overall market of around 40%. 
wow. that's, that, that was the, the, the performance really uh, of the stock market. But what we're saying now is the market now looks cheap, uh, definitely, um, given that it's down uh, quite significantly. Uh, we still feel that there are certain companies that are, are quite solid um, and uh, defensive, uh, despite you know the fact that it's an electioneering uh, environment. So we favor you know, agriculture or consumer-facing companies where we are recommending the likes of Delta Corporation, Insco Africa, Mikos Limited, and Hippo Valley. We think that you know, investors this year should be quite uh, cautious. They should focus on quality. Uh, and have a long-term perspective, again, that we are now uh, in an election earning uh, season. Great stuff. Batanai, Matsika, always a pleasure talking to you, giving us the lowdown on what's going on in Zimbabwe. Very interesting year ahead with elections. Same in Nigeria. Batanai, Matsika, head of uh, research at uh, Morgan & Co. Thank you so much for talking to us. Appreciate your time. It is a global business report here on Arise. News. talking fashion up next, uh, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Adjust to the new realities for operating your business and engaging with your customers, let us help you transform your business into a digital powerhouse capable of adapting and taking advantage of today's opportunities. With our best-in-class array of digital solutions, you can conduct your business, receive payments from your customers, and perform transactions quickly, safely, and conveniently, because we've got you covered with the right people, technology, and service offerings. us today and let us take your business to its zenith. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat. So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the roar alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all. to the global business report in Rise News. Fashion, big business. This February, uh, Rise Fashion Week is returning to Lagos for a three-day celebration of Rise's impact on the fashion industry in Africa and across the globe. After conquering the world at the Dubai Expo in 2021, titled Rise Fashion Week and Jazz Festival, a special edition will take place on the 2nd to the 4th of February and will take attendees and fashion enthusiasts through an exciting journey filled with enlightening experiences with more than 25 world-class designers and jazz-themed performances from acclaimed international artists. More fashion news. Women's wear brand Sosander has announced its latest retail link-up and its first move into physical stores in a deal with supermarket giant Sainsbury's, the company which originally sold on its own web store but has also added link-ups with John Lewis, M&S, Next, J.D. Williams, and Very Online said it has entered into an agreement to sell a curated collection of products through the supermarket business. Via the new wholesale agreement, a selected range will begin to be sold through Sainsbury's during 2023, initially online only, but with selected stores planned later this year. 
South Korean sportswear giant Fila has uh, holdings has announced the appointment of Todd Klein uh, to be the president of Fila USA Incorporated. The operator of the Fila brand said Klein will helm the North American region for Fila following the retirement of Jennifer Estabrook, who was named president of North America back in 2019. In this position, Fila Holdings said Klein will work to elevate brand equity in line with its goals for North America under its five-year global strategy, dubbed Winning Together. The strategy aims to deliver unified products and marketing worldwide by redefining Fila's brand value, building a customer experience-oriented business model, and pursuing sustainable growth, according to the company. Uh, inclusive beauty e-commerce destination uh, 13 Loon has announced that it raised about $8 million in a seed plus investment round with new participation from the Brain Trust Fund. The capital is expected to drive the brand's omni-channel approach and will support brick and mortar experience 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 I can't talk anymore experiential retail and private band expansion with this investment 13 loon will also reach profitability according to them in 2023 it was launched by industry veterans uh, Nakio Greco and Patrick Herning in 2020 which is 13 foundational black founded brands the e-commerce destination has since grown to offer over 160 beauty brands on its platform 90% of which are black owned with the remaining 10% being from other brands um, technology it's giving fashion various ways to display its new offerings. An example, uh, Balenciaga, that's recently been mired in controversy, released its fall 2021 fashion collection in the form of a video game which saw players travel through a Wonderland-style future world, passing avatars dressed in ripped jeans and metal armor boots on the way. Is that, is, that, is that viable? How much further can this tech fashion marriage go? Mayowa Ige, Senior Associate with Financial Directives Company Limited, joins us to discuss. Mayowa, good morning to you, and thanks for joining us. Uh, so what do you make of it? Is that, is this, you know, I think, who else is doing this? Balenciaga, uh, Louis Vuitton, I think Burberry, all going this video game route. Is it trendy, or is this something that could actually be, have some value? Hi, Rosa. Thank you for having me again. So um, definitely looking at the idea behind this, the collaboration between the fashion brands and video game gaming companies definitely is trendy, right? But there's actually some real value to it mm. if you actually look at it right. So um, we, this, this, this growing, we're looking at the um, emergence of this growing significance of video games globally and also how they're in, being integrated into different aspects of the society. Let's look at the global gaming market, for instance. In 2022, it was forecasted to grow to about um, $184 billion, and it's expected to grow as high as $211 billion by tw um, 2025, right? And so this, this, this is mainly due or pa partially due to a growing um, em emergence of a new generation of, g of gamers who have a very large spending power. And I'm talking about the Gen Z, yeah. right? 90% of game, uh, Gen Zs are, 90% of Gen Zs are video gamers, right? Yeah. Compared to about 59% of the of the of global population who are gamers. And so this trend is just um, looking at that aspect of of the society, the growing population of, of the gaming society, and then fashion brands are also looking at it. Well, so this um, going, um, gaming market is offering fashion brands the opportunity to actually reach out to a new market, to actually create new and unique experiences for their co co customers. So it's it's not there's actually value there for both the gaming company and fashion brands. So I mean, but if you don't play video games, then I don't know, the appeal probably wouldn't be there. So this, this is reaching out. They're just trying to get increased market share, basically. Is that, is that what, what we're looking at? Well, yes. So next thing, if, you, if you're not a gamer, but you're a fashion enthusiast, for instance, you may not particularly um, feel the specific collaborations, but then you would appreciate the design, fashion design aspect of these um, gaming companies. So there's still that part of it that would appeal to the wider um, fashion audience. But then again, these fashion brands are trying to also appeal to a growing emerging market, the Gen Zs, the younger generation, who actually have a high spending power. Okay, so I'm glad you mentioned design, because the images we're looking at, that is from the video game. So in case people think this is re real human beings, this is actually from the game. Um, does it expand design then? 
Well, definitely, yes, right? There's, there's, there's definitely going to be some inspiration from, from this for fashion designers. Already, fashion tech designers are already becoming, they're prevalent these days. I mean, Met Gala 2019, right, when you right. look at that, see what is happening with fashion there. Yeah. We look at Zendaya in 2019, it was a show-stopping moment yeah. when she came up with the Cinderella ball gown that lit up with the fairy, her stylist being her yeah. fairy godmother. We're seeing how fashion is being integrated into, um, into technology is being integrated into fashion and so it will keep on driving um, inspiration for fashion designers on how they can extend the human body with their material, incorporating tools like 3D printing, augmented reality, um, artificial intelligence into into their manufacturing of their textiles and everything. And so there's definitely there's going to be a mix of inspiration from that. Is this a West? You mentioned 3D printing, artificial intelligence, and all these you know buzzwords. Is this a Western world phenomenon though? Um, for the development Developed or developing economies, can they can they can this marriage work for them or can they tap in? You know, well, it's right now it's a Western it's a Western um, phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, fashion, these fashion brands are more prevalent in the West, yeah. right? Video gaming is more prevalent in the West, so right now it's a, fashion, it's a Western thing. But as time goes on, it will catch up globally. But then we have to still look at the fact that when we look at developing nations like Africa, internet penetration is uh -huh. a thing, yeah. and things like this would actually may actually limit how much of this trend catch up, would catch up in in places like Africa. I want to ask you about, we saw that deal with Sainsbury's and all this online physical uh, shopping. Uh, 2021, what are the numbers? I think 2.1 billion people shopped online. There we go. 2.1 billion people shopped online in 2021. Global e-commerce sales forecast was $4.8 trillion. It's expected to grow to $6.4 trillion by 2024. Is the online shopping, okay, that's an appropriate headline. Is this online shopping hype real? Or are more people still likely to go physically into stores? Well, um, if we look at the numbers, like you just mentioned, there's a growing trend. So we can't just say that there's no, there's no, it's not, it's just all hype, right? The numbers are showing something. But also when we look at the past from pre-pandemic levels, we're seeing that um, online sales are dropping to pre-pandemic yeah, levels. Yeah. We're seeing that um, store, store purchases are increasing and almost at pre-pandemic levels. And there's still that thing. Human beings have been shopping physically for years. Mm. It wouldn't take two years, three years, can't just change their, their, their habits. Humans are creatures of mm. habit, right? And so we will still, I think that going forward, we will see a balance between online purchasing and fiscal purchasing. But we can't just say that um, fiscal purchasing would be out of trend anytime soon. But online would actually still have a place for times when people do not want to come out, do not want to come out to shop or stuff. And then there's still that thing of you wanting to enter the store to fill the clothes by yourself. Yeah, exactly. Because I tend to, I mean, the whole the whole matter of, the, the, I guess, with e-commerce, especially shopping here, where you're worried if the, what you order online won't be the correct size yeah. or it won't fit. Um, anyway, so as far as the outlook, you, you're, you're positive, though, with where fashion is going with tech. And also online shopping uh, as well. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Well, we'll see how things work out. Once again, the Arise Fashion Week, uh, if we can put that up, that is February the 2nd uh, through the 4th. Yep, future forward, 2nd through the 4th, coming back to Lagos uh, after, you know, conquering the rest of the world. Plus, there's going to be jazz thrown in there. Very, very interesting. Looking forward to that. We'll be covering a lot of fashion going uh, forward. It's the Global Business Report here on Arise News. Mayowa Ige, Senior Associate, uh, Financial Derivatives Company Limited. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate yeah. your time. That's going to do it for the Global Business Report. Do stay tuned to Arise News. From all of us, thank you so much for watching. Thanks for your company. I'm Rosu Sodiri. Up next, it's Newsday, so stay tuned. Yesterday, I got a call from Glue. I won the three bedroom Pongalu. I want a generator, 
by participating in the festival of Joy Promo by Glow. Hey, Glow, don't do this one for me. Glow to make it to me with sewing machine. I won generator last year. This year, I won for us. It's a celebration like no other, with prizes like no other. 20 new houses to be won. 24 brand new cars. 200 sewing machines, 100 generators, 1,000 rechargeable fan. Glow Festival of Joy promo. Dial star 611 hash now. Send and receive money across 30 countries with SEN. Do it now. Something exciting is happening at Arise Play. Where's the light here? I wonder, where's the light here? How blurry can it be? Why can't I see it? Did you miss it? Look again. Deal with him. Hey, Ricky. Hurt him. Bad. This is a bold new world of entertainment. Download the app and subscribe. Arise Play. Beyond Streaming. Knowledge is power. Information is currency. Trust us to tell you what you need to hear. Welcome to the program. You're with Arise News in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Breaking news, exclusive interviews, unrivaled analysis. It's you, the audience, who drives our agenda. We tell the stories that inform you, the stories that are important to you, and the stories that are about you. We are not every news channel. We are Arise News.
love a bit of showbiz. If it's happening in the world of entertainment, you'll be hearing about it here. From what's trending on the socials, to music and movies, and all the latest showbiz gossip from around the world. Join us for a front row seat at the Oscars in Los Angeles, or the biggest moments from Fashion Week. It's fun, it's fresh, and it's packed full of all the entertainment news you need to know. You heard it here first. I'm Kachi Ofia, and this is Arise 360, where every culture matters. Welcome to Rise News from wherever in the world you're joining us. I'm Cynthia Are. This is Newsday. I am Bambai Mutiniri Epeyong. And for the next four hours, we'll be bringing you all of the day's stories live from Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos, including calls for protests across Gaza after the deadliest Israeli raid in the occupied West Bank in decades. Five former U.S. police officers are charged with the murder of a black man in Memphis, Tennessee. United Nations Children's Agency UNICEF calls for the release of 13 children abducted during a deadly attack in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. And the death toll from a bomb blast that struck a group of herders in the central Nigerian state of Nasarawa has risen to 40 from 27. Details in just a moment. Please stay with us. In our top story this hour, protests are expected in the occupied Palestinian territories after the most deadly Israeli raid in the occupied West Bank in nearly two decades. Rockets were fired from Gaza towards southern Israel overnight. Now, Israel responded with airstrikes on what it says were underground rocket factories that followed a raid by Israeli forces on the Jenin refugee camp. Nine people were killed, including two children. Palestinians are observing three days of mourning. Now, tensions have recently risen in the occupied West Bank as the Israeli military continues what it describes as an anti-terrorism offensive. At least 30 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces in the West Bank so far this year. The United States says it's deeply concerned with the rise in violence and appealed for calm. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is due to visit the region on Sunday. The UN Security Council was scheduled to discuss the Jenin raid at an emergency meeting in the coming hours. The department has been uh, working the bones and in touch with uh, both our immediate U.S. State Department counterparts um, uh, this, over the course of the morning, but as well as others in the region. Uh, specifically, uh, if you'll give me the opportunity, Matt, we are aware of the reports that today in Janine, at least 10 Palestinians, including militants, and at least one civilian were killed and over 20 injured during an Israeli Defense Force counterterrorism operation against a Palestinian Islamic Jihad cell. We recognize the very real security challenges challenges facing Israel and the Palestinian Authority and condemn terrorist groups planning and carrying out attacks against innocent civilians. We also regret the loss of innocent lives and injuries to civilians and are deeply concerned by the escalating cycle of violence in the West Bank. I want to underscore the urgent need for all parties to de-escalate, to prevent further loss of civilian life, and to work together to improve the security situation in the West Bank. Palestinians and Israelis equally deserve to live safely and securely. And on some local American news, U.S. President Joe Biden has appealed for calm as officials in the city of Memphis prepare to publish police body cam video of officers carrying out a fatal attack on a black man they'd stopped for an alleged traffic offense. 29-year-old Tyre Nichols was stopped by traffic police for suspected reckless driving. His lawyer said he was kicked, punched, and tasered. The five officers involved are now facing murder charges. In a video statement, the mayor of Memphis condemned the killing of Mr. Nichols. The officers were dismissed from their jobs last week. I'm sickened by what I saw and what we've learned through our extensive and thorough investigation. I've seen the video, and as DA Morley stated, you will too. 
In a word, it's absolutely appalling. Let me be clear. What happened here does not at all reflect proper policing. This was wrong. This was criminal. It, there was an initial traffic stop. We won't comment right now on the presence or absence of legality of the stop, but there was a traffic stop. And there was an initial altercation uh, involving several officers and Mr. Nichols. Um, pepper spray was deployed. Uh, the uh, suspect, or not the suspect, Mr. Nichols, uh, fled on foot. There was another altercation uh, at a nearby location at which the, the, the serious injuries uh, were experienced by Mr. Nichols. After some period of time of um, waiting around afterwards, he was taken away by an ambulance. Beyond that, I don't really think I, we should go into any further details. So there was a delay in a call? The police delayed calling an ambulance for Th there was a There was an elapsed period of time, but I believe that if you watch the video, you'll be able to make that judgment for yourself. Right. Eric, you want to... I'm trying to... I'm <laughs> Well, understandably, the city of Memphis is on edge, and police there have increased patrols ahead of expected protests. The family of Tyre Nichols joined mourners at a Memphis skate park. The father of one was an avid skateboarder. His mother called for calm ahead of the release of the police video of the events leading up to her son's death. That video is set to be released at 7 p.m. local time. When that tape comes out tomorrow, mm -hmm. it's going to be horrific. My Lord, my Lord. I didn't see it, but from what I hear, it's going to be horrific. But I want each and every one of you to protest in peace. I don't want us burning up our cities, tearing up the streets. Yes, ma'am. Because that's not what my son stood for. Yes, and if you guys are here for me and Tyree, yes. then you will protest peacefully. Yes, ma'am. Well, elsewhere, police officers in Haiti have tried to storm the official residence of the Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, and have overrun the main airport. They were protesting against the number of their colleagues killed by the many armed gangs that operate in the Caribbean nation. Scores of civilians and angry police officers took to the streets in Port-au-Prince to denounce the violence. They want urgent action to protect police forces from violent street gangs, which at points have controlled large districts of the capital and other major cities. Well, on Wednesday alone, seven officers were killed in a shootout. The violence comes following a weeks-long standoff last year at the country's main fuel terminal as it was blockaded by the gangs attempting to force Mr. Henri from office. We are going to attack all the ministers, all the directors general. There has to be a revolution. The children have to go to school for this revolution to take place. There has to be a bloodbath. All these policemen have been killed, and the Prime Minister has not reacted to pay tribute to them. We are on the streets to ask for justice for our brothers killed by bandits. We will take to the streets every day until we find an answer. We are in the streets to support the police. Prime Minister Ariel Henry must go. The police need the support of the people in the fight. Arius' aim is to massacre the police in order to legitimize a military intervention. We are against it and we need proper weapons to deal with the armed guns. Now, shares in one of India's biggest companies have plunged in value as accusations of accounting fraud and stock manipulation unnerve investors. The Adani Group was founded by Asia's richest man, Gautam Adani. He's rejected the allegations made by the New York-based investment firm Hindenburg Research. The group has now lost almost $48 billion of its market value after the research was made public on Wednesday. It is now considering legal action against Hindenburg Research. 
Now, the United States says its special forces have killed a senior member of the Islamic State group in Somalia, along with 10 of his associates. Bilal al-Sudani is alleged to be a key figure in the funding and expansion of the Islamist militant group across Africa and Afghanistan. Officials said he was killed during a gunfight in an undisclosed location in northern Somalia. The Peruvian government has confirmed the police and military are preparing for a or preparing a joint operation to dismantle roadblocks set up by protesters demanding the resignation of Dino Bularte. In further protests on Thursday, police fired tear gas at protesters. A joint statement from the Interior and Defense Ministry said the blockades were causing shortages of food and fuel and also preventing people from getting urgent medical attention. President Bularte came to power last month after former President Pedro Castillo was arrested and jailed for trying to dissolve Congress. More than 50 people have been killed as a result of the unrest. They won't let us go ahead with our peaceful march, in which we demand that Mrs. Dina Boluat resigns and also that there has to be a new board in the Congress of the Republic. We also demand early elections. I can only regret and condemn the actions of these violent groups who, taking advantage of the demonstrations, have caused damage and have prevented the Peruvian people's right to health from being guaranteed. Let us continue to work together for social peace, dialogue, health and the well-being of the Peruvian people. May we all embrace each other in a single heart. You're watching Newsday. We've got plenty more still ahead, so do stay with us. As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat. So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the roar alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all. There is only one place that the world will come to run on Saturday the 4th of February 2023. Over bridges, waterfronts, running across 10 kilometers and 42 kilometers of asphalt. Access Bank Lagos City Marathon will be targeting 100,000 runners from around the world, ready to flood the streets of Lagos. The 10-kilometer race will set off at 9.30 a.m. at the Grace Court Garden Events Place, Durasimi Eti, Lekki Face 1, while the 42-kilometer race will set off at 6.30 a.m. in front of the iconic National Stadium, Surulere. And both races will finish on top of the sandy shores of the stunning Echo Atlantic City. From Oshodi to Uwuru, Alakbere to Admiralty, Ikoi to Echo Atlantic. The race is routed through the warm, meandering feet, blistering streets of this historic city. So what are you waiting for? Get ready to push beyond the limit. Access Bank Lagos City Marathon 2023. Make it count. The coordinator, Tinebu Shetima Zamfara State Campaign Council, Senator Kabiru Garba Marafa, OFR CON, Marafa Ngusau, cordially invites all APC members, supporters, and well wishers in Zamfara State to attend the party's presidential candidate rally that will see the presentation of His Excellency Chief Ashwaju Ahmed Bola Tinebu and His Excellency Al Haji Kashmir Shetima as APC presidential candidate and running mate, respectively, in the 2023 general election to the people of the state. The event is scheduled to take place as follows. Date, Saturday, January 28, 2023. Venue, Trade Fair Complex, Bypass, Gustafsson for State. Time, 10 a.m. prompt. Chief Host, His Excellency Bello Mohammed M.O.N. Matawalla Maradun Shetiman Sokoto, Executive Governor, Zamfar State, and Coordinator, Northwest Presidential Campaign Council. Chairman of the event, His Excellency Honorable Abdulaziz Yari Abubakar, Shetiman Zamfara. 
former executive governor Zamfara State and chairman Zamfara State APC Gubernatorial Campaign Council. Special guest of honors, APC National Chairman, His Excellency Abdullahi Adamu Trakin Kefi, Director General APC Presidential Campaign Council and Executive Governor Plateau State, Chief Simon Lalong. Special guest, all APC governors in Northwest Zone, National and Zonal Executives of APC, National Zonal and State APC stakeholders. Host of the event, Al Haji Tukuru Umar Damfulani Maikatako, APC Chairman Zamfara State. <laughs> Announcer, Honorable Ibrahim Maigandi Damaliki Gidangoga, Chairman Publicity Subcommittee, Tinibusha Tima Zamfara State Campaign Council. <laughs> Welcome back to Newsday here on Arise News. Now, data has become more valuable than ever, specifically in this age where digital footprint continues to expand and especially with the growth of social media platforms and mobile technology. These advancements can be beneficial, but many bad actors collect and use the personal data of individuals